Section 1 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. Selected Letters, Number 4 and 5, by Ludwig von Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number four. To Eleanor von Brunig, Bonn. Vienna, November 2, 1793. My highly esteemed Eleanor, my dearest friend, a year of my stay in this capital has nearly elapsed before you receive a letter from me and yet the most vivid remembrance of you is ever present with me. I have often conversed in thought with you and your dear family, though not always in the happy mood I could have wished, for that fatal misunderstanding still hovered before me, and my conduct at that time is now hateful in my sight. But so it was, and how much would I give to have the power wholly to obliterate from my life a mode of acting so degrading to myself and so contrary to the usual tenor of my character. Many circumstances indeed contributed to estrange us, and I suspect that those tale-bearers who repeated alternately to you and to me our mutual expressions were the chief obstacles to any good understanding between us. Each believed that what was said proceeded from deliberate conviction, whereas it arose only from anger, fanned by others, so we were both mistaken. Your good and noble disposition, my dear friend, is sufficient security that you have long since forgiven me. We are told that the best proof of sincere contrition is to acknowledge our faults. And this is what I wish to do. Let us now draw a veil over the whole affair, learning one lesson from it, that when friends are at variance, it is always better to employ no mediator, but to communicate directly with each other. With this you will receive a dedication from me, the variations on Seville Belair. My sole wish is that the work were greater and more worthy of you. I was applied to here publish this little work, and I take advantage of the opportunity, my beloved Eleanor, to give you a proof of my regard and friendship for yourself, and also a token of my endearing remembrance of your family. Pray, then, accept this trifle, and do not forget that it is offered by a devoted friend. Oh, if it only gives you pleasure, my wish will be fulfilled. May it in some degree recall the time when I passed so many happy hours in your house. Perhaps it may serve to remind you of me till I return though this is indeed a distant prospect. Oh, how we shall then rejoice together, my dear Eleanor! You will, I trust, find your friend a happier man, all former forbidding, careworn furrows smoothed away by time and better fortune. When you see B. Koch, note, subsequently, Countess Belderbush, Pray say that it is unkind in her never once to have written to me. I wrote to her twice and three times to Malchus. Note, afterwards, Westphalian Minister of Finance. But no answer. Tell her that if she does not choose to write herself, I beg that she will at least urge Malchus to do so. At the close of my letter, I venture to make one more request. I am anxious to be so fortunate as again to possess an Angola waistcoat knitted by your hand, my dear friend. Forgive my indiscreet request. It proceeds from my great love for
for all that comes from you. And I may privately admit that a little vanity is connected with it. Namely, that I may say, I possess something from the best and most admired young lady in Bonn. I still have the one you were so good as to give me in Bonn. But change of fashion has made it look so antiquated that I can only treasure it in my wardrobe as your gift, and thus still very dear to me. You would make me very happy by soon writing me a letter. If mine causes you any pleasure, I promise you to do as you wish, and write as often as it lies in my power. Indeed, everything is acceptable to me that can serve to show you how truly I am your admiring and sincere friend. L. V. Beethoven P.S. The variations are rather difficult to play, especially the shake in the coda. But do not be alarmed at this, being so contrived that you only require to play the shake and leave out the other notes, which also occur in the violin part. I never would have written it in this way had I not occasionally observed that there was a certain individual in Vienna who, when I extemporized the previous evening, not unfrequently wrote down the next day many of the peculiarities of my music, adopting them as his own. For instance, the Abigailinic. Concluding, therefore, that some of these things would soon appear, I resolved to anticipate this. Another reason also was to puzzle some of the piano fort teachers here, many of whom are my mortal foes. So I wish to revenge myself on them in this way, knowing that they would occasionally be asked to play the variations when these gentlemen would not appear to much advantage. Beethoven End of letter number four Letter number five to Eleanor Van Brunig, Bonn. The beautiful neckcloth embroidered by your own hand was the greatest possible surprise to me, yet welcome as the gift was, it awakened within me feelings of sadness. Its effect was to recall former days and put me to shame by your noble conduct to me. I indeed need little thought that you still consider me worthy of your remembrance. Oh, if you could have witnessed my emotions yesterday when this incident occurred, you would not think that I exaggerate in saying that such a token of your recollection brought tears to my eyes, and made me feel very sad. Little as I may deserve favor in your eyes, believe me, my dear friend, let me call you so. I have suffered, and still suffer severely, from the privation of your friendship. Never can I forget you and your dear mother. You were so kind to me that your loss neither can nor will be easily replaced. I know what I have forfeited, and what you were to me. But in order to fill up this blank, I must recur to scenes equally painful for you to hear and for me to detail. As a slight requital of your kind souvenir, I take the liberty to send you some variations and a rondo with violin accompaniment. I have a great deal to do, or I would long since have transcribed the sonata I promised you. It is as yet a mere sketch in manuscript, and to copy it would be a difficult task, even for the clever and practiced Paraquin. Note, counterbass in the electoral orchestra. You can have the rondo copied and return the score. What I now send is the only one of my works at all suitable for you. Besides, as you are going to Kirpin, note, where my uncle of the family lived, I thought these trifles might cause you pleasure. Farewell, my friend, for it is impossible for me to give you any other name. However indifferent I may be to you, believe me, I shall ever continue 
to revere you and your mother as I have always done. If I can in any way contribute to the fulfillment of a wish of yours, do not fail to let me know, for I have no other means of testifying my gratitude for past friendship. I wish you an agreeable journey and that your dear mother may return entirely restored to health. Think sometimes of your affectionate friend, Beethoven. End of letter number five. End of section one of selected letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Robert Scott, June the 20th, 2007. Section 2 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar. Selected Letters, number 13, by Ludwig von Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 13. To Pastor Amenda. 1800. My dear, my good Amenda, my warm-hearted friend, I received and read your last letter with deep emotion and with mingled pain and pleasure. To what can I compare your fidelity and devotion to me? Ah, it is indeed delightful that you still continue to love me so well. I know how to prize you and to distinguish you from all others. You are not like my Vienna friends. No, you are one of those whom the soil of my fatherland is wont to bring forth. How often I wish that you were with me, for your Beethoven is very unhappy. You must know that one of my most precious faculties that of hearing is become very defective. Even while you were still with me, I felt indications of this, though I said nothing. But it is now much worse. Whether I shall ever be cured remains yet to be seen. It is supposed to proceed from the state of my digestive organs, but I am almost entirely recovered in that respect. I hope, indeed, that my hearing may improve, but I scarcely think so for attacks of this kind are the most incurable of all. How sad my life must now be, forced to shun all that is most dear and precious to me, and to live with such miserable egotists as blank, name unknown or illegible. I can with truth say that of all my friends, Lichnowsky, Prince Karl, is the most genuine. He last year settled six hundred florins on me, which, together with the good sale of my works, enables me to live free from care as to my maintenance. All that I now write I can dispose of five times over, and be well paid into the bargain. I have been writing a good deal, latterly, and as I hear that you have ordered some pianos, I will send you some of my compositions in the packing case of one of these instruments by which means they will not cost you so much. To my great comfort, a person has returned here with whom I can enjoy the pleasures of society and disinterested friendship, one of the friends of my youth, Stefan von Brunig. I have often spoken to him of you, and told him that since I left my fatherland, you are one of those to whom my heart specially clings. Z, possibly Zmescal, does not seem quite to please him. He is, and always will be, too weak for true friendship, and I look on him and, blank, name unknown or legible, as mere instruments on which I play as I please, but never can they bear noble testimony to my inner and outward energies, or feel true sympathy with me. I value them only in so far as their services deserve. Oh, how happy should I now be had I my full sense of hearing! I would then hasten to you, whereas, as it is, I must withdraw from everything. My best years will thus pass away, 
without affecting what my talents and powers might have enabled me to perform. How melancholy is the resignation in which I must take refuge! I had determined to rise superior to all this, but how is that possible? If in the course of six months my malady be pronounced incurable, then, Amenda, I shall appeal to you to leave all else and come to me when I intend to travel. My affliction is less distressing when playing and composing, and most so in intercourse with others, and you must be my companion. I have a conviction that good fortune will not forsake me, for to what may I not at present aspire? Since you were here I have written everything except operas and church music. You will not, I know, refuse my petition. You will help your friend to bear his burden and his calamity. I have also very much perfected my pianoforte playing, and I hope that a journey of this kind may possibly contribute to your own success in life, and you would thenceforth always remain with me. I duly received all your letters, and though I did not reply to them, you were constantly present with me, and my heart beats as tenderly as ever for you. I beg you will keep the fact of my deafness a profound secret, and not confide it to any human being. Write to me frequently. Your letters, however short, console and cheer me, so I shall soon hope to hear from you. Do not give your quartet to anyone, in F, opus 18, number 1, as I have altered it very much, having only now succeeded in writing quartets properly. This you will at once perceive when you receive it. Now, farewell, my dear kind friend. If by any chance I can serve you here, I need not say that you have only to command me. You are faithful and truly attached. L. V. Beethoven End of letter number 13 End of section 2 of Selected Letters of Beethoven As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Scott Farquhar, Baltimore, Maryland. Section 3 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Selected Letters, Numbers 14 and 18 by Ludwig van Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 14. To Wegeler. Vienna, June 29th, 1800. My dear and valued Wegeler, How much I thank you for your remembrance of me, little as I deserve it, or have sought to deserve it, and yet you are so kind that you allow nothing, not even my unpardonable neglect, to discourage you, always remaining the same true, good, and faithful friend. That I can ever forget you or yours, once so dear and precious to me, do not for a moment believe. There are times when I find myself longing to see you again, and wishing that I could go to stay with you. My fatherland, that lovely region where I first saw the light, is still as distinct and beauteous in my eyes as when I quitted you. In short, I shall esteem the time when I once more see you, and again greet Father Rhine, as one of the happiest periods of my life. When this may be, I cannot yet tell, but at all events I may say that you shall not see me again till I have become eminent, not only as an artist, but better and more perfect as a man, and if the condition of our fatherland be then more prosperous, my art shall be entirely devoted to the benefit of the poor. O oh, blissful moment! How happy do I esteem myself that I can expedite it, and bring it to pass! You desire to know something of my position. Well, it is by no means bad. However incredible it may appear, I must tell you that Lichnowsky has been— and still is my warmest friend. Slight dissensions occurred occasionally between us, and yet they only served to strengthen our friendship. He settled on me last year the sum of six hundred florins, 
for which I am to draw on him till I can procure some suitable situation. My compositions are very profitable, and I may really say that I have almost more commissions than it is possible for me to execute. I can have six or seven publishers or more for every piece, if I choose. They no longer bargain with me. I demand, and they pay. So you see this is a very good thing. For instance, I have a friend in distress, and my purse does not admit of my assisting him at once, but I have only to sit down and write, and in a short time he is relieved. I am also become more economical than formerly. If I finally settle here, I don't doubt I shall be able to secure a particular day every year for a concert, of which I have already given several. That malicious demon, however, bad health, has been a stumbling-block in my path. My hearing during the last three years has become gradually worse. The chief cause of this infirmity proceeds from the state of my digestive organs, which, as you know, were formerly bad enough, but have latterly become much worse, and being constantly afflicted with diarrhoea has brought on extreme weakness. Frank, director of the general hospital, drove to restore the tone of my digestion by tonics, and my hearing by oil of almonds, but alas, these did me no good whatever. My hearing became worse, and my digestion continued in its former plight. This went on till the autumn of last year, when I was often reduced to utter despair. Then some medical assignus recommended me cold baths, but a more judicious doctor, the tepid ones of the Danube, which did wonders for me. My digestion improved, but my hearing remained the same, or in fact rather got worse. I did indeed pass a miserable winter. I suffered from most dreadful spasms, and sank back into my former condition. Thus it went on till about a month ago, when I consulted Faring, an army surgeon, under the belief that my maladies required surgical advice. Besides, I had every confidence in him. He succeeded in almost entirely checking the violent diarrhoea, and ordered me the tepid baths of the Danube, into which I pour some strengthening mixture. He gave me no medicine except some digestive pills four days ago, and a lotion for my ears. I certainly do feel better and stronger, but my ears are buzzing and ringing perpetually, day and night. I can with truth say that my life is very wretched. For nearly two years past I have avoided all society, because I find it impossible to say to people, I am deaf. In any other profession this might be more tolerable, but in mine such a condition is truly frightful. Besides, what would my enemies say to this? And they are not few in number. To give you some idea of my extraordinary deafness, I must tell you that in the theatre I am obliged to lean close up against the orchestra in order to understand the actors, and when a little way off I hear none of the high notes of instruments or singers. It is most astonishing that in conversation some people never seem to observe this, being subject to fits of absence, they attribute it to that cause. I often can scarcely hear a person if speaking low. I can distinguish the tones, but not the words, and yet I feel it intolerable if any one shouts to me. Heaven alone knows how it is to end. Faring declares that I shall certainly improve, even if I be not entirely restored. How often have I cursed my existence! Plutarch led me to resignation— I shall strive, if possible, to set fate at defiance, although there must be moments in my life when I cannot fail to be the most unhappy of God's creatures. I entreat you to say nothing of my affliction to any one, not even to Lorchen. I confide the secret to you alone, and entreat you some day to correspond with Vering on the subject. If I continue in the same state I shall come to you in the ensuing spring, when you must engage a house for me somewhere in the country, amid beautiful scenery, and I shall then become a rustic for a year, which may, perhaps, effect a change. Resignation! What a miserable refuge! And yet it is my sole remaining one. You will forgive my thus appealing to your kindly sympathies at a time when your own position is sad enough. Stefan Brüning is here, and we are together almost every day. It does me so much good to revive old feelings. 
He has really become a capital good fellow, not devoid of talent, and his heart, like that of us all, pretty much in the right place. I have very charming rooms at present, adjoining the Bastille, the ramparts, and peculiarly valuable to me on account of my health, at Baron Pascolati's. I do really think that I shall be able to arrange that Breuning shall come to me. You shall have your Antiochus, a picture, and plenty of my music besides, if indeed it will not cost you too much. Your love of art does honestly rejoice me. Only say how it is to be done, and I will send you all my works, which now amount to a considerable number, and are daily increasing. I beg you will let me have my grandfather's portrait as soon as possible by the post, in return for which I send you that of his grandson, your loving and attached Beethoven. It has been brought out here by Artaria, who, as well as many other publishers, has often urged this on me. I intend soon to write to Stoffeln, Christoph von Breuning, and plainly admonish him about his surly humour. I mean to sound in his ears our old friendship, and to insist on his promising me not to annoy you further in your sad circumstances. I will also write to the amiable Lorchen. Never have I forgotten one of you, my kind friends, though you did not hear from me, but you know well that writing never was my fort, even my best friends having received no letters from me for years. I live wholly in my music, and scarcely is one work finished when another is begun. Indeed, I am now often at work on three or four things at the same time. Do write to me frequently, and I will strive to find time to write to you also. Give my remembrances to all, especially to the kind Frau Hofreithen, von Breuning, and say to her that I am still subject to an occasional raptus. As for K, I am not at all surprised at the change in her. Fortune rolls like a ball, and does not always stop before the best and noblest. As to Ries, court musician in Bonn, to whom pray cordially remember me, I must say one word. I will write to you more particularly about his son, Ferdinand, although I believe that he would be more likely to succeed in Paris than in Vienna, which is already overstocked, and where even those of the highest merit find it a hard matter to maintain themselves. By next autumn or winter I shall be able to see what can be done for him, because then all the world returns to town. Farewell, my kind, faithful Wegeler. Rest assured of the love and friendship of your Beethoven. End of letter number 14 Letter number 18 To Herr von Wegeler Vienna, November 16th, 1800 My dear Wegeler, I thank you for this fresh proof of your interest in me, especially as I so little deserve it. You wish to know how I am, and what remedies I use. Unwilling, as I always feel, to discuss this subject, still I feel less reluctant to do so with you than with any other person. For some months past Vering has ordered me to apply blisters on both arms, of a particular kind of bark, with which you are probably acquainted, a disagreeable remedy, independent of the pain, as it deprives me of the free use of my arms for a couple of days at a time, till the blisters have drawn sufficiently. The ringing and buzzing in my ears have certainly rather decreased, particularly in the left ear, in which the malady first commenced, but my hearing is not at all improved. In fact, I fear that it is become rather worse. My health is better, and after using the tepid baths for a time, I feel pretty well for eight or ten days. I seldom take tonics, but I have begun applications of herbs, according to your advice. Faring will not hear of plunge-baths, but I am much dissatisfied with him. He is neither so attentive nor so indulgent as he ought to be to such a malady. If I did not go to him, which is no easy matter, I should never see him at all. What is your opinion of Schmid, an army surgeon? I am unwilling to make any change, but it seems to me that Faring is too much of a practitioner, to acquire new ideas by reading. On this point Schmidt appears to be a very different man, and would probably be less negligent with regard to my case. I hear wonders of galvanism. What do you say to it? 
A physician told me that he knew a deaf and dumb child whose hearing was restored by it, in Berlin, and likewise a man who had been deaf for seven years and recovered his hearing. I am told that your friend Schmidt is at this moment making experiments on the subject. I am now leading a somewhat more agreeable life, as of late I have been associating more with other people. You could scarcely believe what a sad and dreary life mine has been for the last two years, my defective hearing everywhere pursuing me like a spectre, making me fly from every one, and appear a misanthrope, and yet no one is in reality less so. This change has been wrought by a lovely, fascinating girl, undoubtedly Giulietta, who loves me and whom I love. I have once more had some blissful moments during the last two years, and it is the first time I ever felt that marriage could make me happy. Unluckily she is not in my rank of life, and indeed at this moment I can marry no one. I must first bestir myself actively in the world. Had it not been for my deafness I would have travelled half round the globe ere now, and this I must still do. For me there is no pleasure so great as to promote and to pursue my art. Do not suppose that I could be happy with you. What indeed could make me happier? Your very solicitude would distress me. I should read your compassion every moment in your countenance, which would make me only still more unhappy. What were my thoughts amid the glorious scenery of my fatherland? The hope alone of a happier future, which would have been mine but for this affliction. Oh, I could span the world, were I only free from this. I feel that my youth is only now commencing. Have I not always been an infirm creature? For some time past my bodily strength has been increasing, and it is the same with my mental powers. I feel, though I cannot describe it, that I daily approach the object I have in view, in which alone can your Beethoven live. No rest for him. I know of none but in sleep, and I do grudge being obliged to sacrifice more time to it than formerly. Footnote 1. Were I only half cured of my malady, then I would come to you, and as a more perfect and mature man renew our old friendship. You should then see me as happy as I am ever destined to be here below, not unhappy. No, that I could not endure. I will boldly meet my fate. Never shall it succeed in crushing me. Oh, it is so glorious to live one's life a thousand times over. I feel that I am no longer made for a quiet existence. You will write to me as soon as possible. Pray try to prevail on Stefan, von Breuning, to seek an appointment from the Teutonic Order somewhere. Life here is too harassing for his health. Besides, he is so isolated that I do not see how he is ever to get on. You know the kind of existence here. I do not take it upon myself to say that society would dispel his lassitude, but he cannot be persuaded to go anywhere. A short time since I had some music in my house, but our friend Stephen stayed away. Do recommend him to be more calm and self-possessed, which I have in vain tried to effect, otherwise he can neither enjoy health nor happiness. Tell me in your next letter whether you care about my sending you a large selection of music. You can indeed dispose of what you do not want, and thus repay the expense of the carriage, and have my portrait into the bargain. Say all that is kind and amiable from me to Lorchen, and also to Mamma and Christoph. You still have some regard for me? Always rely on the love as well as the friendship of your Beethoven. Footnote 1. Too much sleep is hurtful, is marked by a thick score in the Odyssey, 45, 393, by Beethoven's hand. See Schindler's Beethoven's Nachlass. End of letter number 18. End of section 3 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. Section 4 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, Number Fifteen, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes 
by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 15 To Countess Giulietta Guicciardi Footnote 1 These letters to his immortal beloved, to whom the C-sharp minor sonata is dedicated, appear here for the first time in their integrity, in accordance with the originals written in pencil on fine note paper, and given in Schindler's Beethoven's Nachlass. There has been much discussion about the date. It is certified, in the first place, in the church register which Alex Thayer saw in Vienna, that Giulietta was married to Count Gallenberg in 1801, and, in the next place, the 6th of July falls on a Monday in 1800. The other reasons which induce me decidedly to fix this latter year as the date of the letter, I mean to give at full length in the second volume of Beethoven's biography. I may also state that Beethoven was at Baths in Hungary at that time. Whether the K in the second letter means Komorn, I cannot tell. Morning, July the 6th, 1800 My angel, my all, my second self! Only a few words to-day, written with a pencil, your own. My residence cannot be settled till to-morrow. What a tiresome loss of time! Why this deep grief when necessity compels? Can our love exist without sacrifices, and by refraining from desiring all things? Can you alter the fact that you are not wholly mine, nor I wholly yours? Ah, contemplate the beauties of nature, and reconcile your spirit to the inevitable. Love demands all, and has a right to do so, and thus it is I feel towards you, and you towards me. But you do not sufficiently remember that I must live both for you and for myself. Were we wholly united, you would feel this sorrow as little as I should. My journey was terrible. I did not arrive here till four o'clock yesterday morning, as no horses were to be had. The drivers chose another route, but what a dreadful one it was! At the last stage I was warned not to travel through the night, and to beware of a certain wood, but this only incited me to go forward, and I was wrong. The carriage broke down, owing to the execrable roads, mere deep rough country lanes, and had it not been for the postilions, I must have been left by the wayside. Esterese, travelling the usual road, had the same fate with eight horses, whereas I had only four. Still, I felt a certain degree of pleasure, which I invariably do when I have happily surmounted any difficulty. But I must now pass from the outer to the inner man. We shall, I trust, soon meet again. Today I cannot impart to you all the reflections I have made during the last few days on my life. Were our hearts closely united for ever, none of these would occur to me. My heart is overflowing with all I have to say to you. Ah, there are moments when I find that speech is actually nothing. Take courage. Continue to be ever my true and only love, my all, as I am yours. The gods must ordain what is further to be and shall be. Your faithful Ludwig Monday evening, July the 6th You grieve, dearest of all beings. I have just heard that the letters must be sent off very early. Mondays and Thursdays are the only days when the post goes to K from here. You grieve. Ah, where I am, there you are ever with me. How earnestly shall I strive to pass my life with you, and what a life will it be? Whereas now, without you, and persecuted by the kindness of others, which I neither deserve nor try to deserve. The servility of man towards his fellow men pains me, and when I regard myself as a component part of the universe, what am I, what is he who is called the greatest? And yet herein are displayed the godlike feelings of humanity. I weep in thinking that you will receive no intelligence from me till probably Saturday. 
however dearly you may love me, I love you more fondly still. Never conceal your feelings from me. Good night. As a patient at these baths, I must now go to rest. A few words are he effaced by Beethoven himself. Oh, heavens! So near, and yet so far! Is not our love a truly celestial mansion, but firm as the vault of heaven itself? July the 7th Good morning. Even before I rise, my thoughts throng to you, my immortal beloved, sometimes full of joy, and yet again sad, waiting to see whether fate will hear us. I must live either wholly with you, or not at all. Indeed, I have resolved to wander far from you. See number 13. Till the moment arrives when I can fly into your arms, and feel that they are my home, and send forth my soul in unison with yours into the realm of spirits. Alas, it must be so. You will take courage, for you know my fidelity. Never can another possess my heart. Never, never. Oh, heavens! Why must I fly from her I so fondly love? And yet my existence in W was as miserable as here. Your love made me the most happy, and yet the most unhappy of men. At my age, life requires a uniform equality. Can this be found in our mutual relations? My angel! I have this moment heard that the post goes every day, so I must conclude that you may get this letter the sooner. Be calm, for we can only attain our object of living together by the calm contemplation of our existence. Continue to love me. Yesterday, today, what longings for you, what tears for you, for you, for you, my life, my all. Farewell. Oh, love me forever, and never doubt the faithful heart of your lover, L. Ever thine, ever mine, ever each other's. End of letter number 15. End of section 4 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Iswa in August 2007 in Belgium. Section 5 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar. Selected Letters, Numbers 19, 20, 21, 22, 25, and 29 by Ludwig von Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 19. To Kappelmeister Hofmeister, Leipzig. Footnote 1. Vienna, December 15th, 1800. My dear brother in art, I have often intended to answer your proposals, but am frightfully lazy about all correspondence. So it is usually a good while before I can make up my mind to write dry letters instead of music. I have, however, at last forced myself to answer your application. Pro primo, I must tell you how much I regret that you, my much-loved brother in the science of music, did not give me some hint so that I might have offered you my quartets, as well as many other things that I have now disposed of. But if you are as conscientious, my dear brother, as many other publishers who grind to death us poor composers, you will know pretty well how to derive ample profit when the works appear. I now briefly state what you can have from me. First, a septet per il violino, viola, violoncello, contrabasso, clarinetto, corno, fagato, tutti obbligati. I can write nothing that is not obbligato, having come into the world with an obbligato accompaniment. This septet pleases very much. For more general use, it might be arranged for one more violino, viola, and violoncello, instead of the three wind instruments, fagato, clarinetto, and corno. Footnote 2. Second, a grand symphony with full orchestra, the first. Third, a pianoforte concerto, 
opus 19, which I by no means assert to be one of my best, any more than the one Molo is to publish here, opus 15. This is for the benefit of the Leipzig critics, because I reserve the best for myself till I set off on my travels. Still, the work will not disgrace you to publish. Fourth, a grand solo sonata, opus 22. These are all I can part with at this moment. A little later, you can have a quintet for stringed instruments, and probably some quartets also, and other pieces that I have not at present beside me. In your answer, you can yourself fix the prices, and as you are neither an Italian nor a Jew, nor am I either, we shall no doubt quickly agree. Farewell, and rest assured, my dear brother in art, of the esteem of your Beethoven. Footnote 1. The letters to Hofmeister, formerly of Vienna, who conducted the correspondence with Beethoven in the name of the firm of Hofmeister and Kuhnel, Bureau de Musique, are given here as they first appeared in 1837 in the Noah Zeitschrift für Musik. On applying to the present representative of that firm, I was told that those who now possess these letters decline giving them out of their own hands and that no copyist can be found able to decipher or transcribe them correctly. Footnote 2. This last phrase is not in the copy before me, but in Marx's biography, who appears to have seen the original. End of letter number 19. Letter number 20. To Kappelmeister Hofmeister. Vienna, January 15, or thereabouts, 1801. I read your letter, dear brother and friend, with much pleasure, and I thank you for your good opinion of me and of my works, and I hope I may continue to deserve it. I also beg you to present all due thanks to Herr K. Kunel for his politeness and friendship towards me. I, on my part, rejoice in your undertakings, and am glad that when works of art do turn out profitable, they fall to the share of true artists rather than to that of mere tradesmen. Your intention to publish Sebastian Bach's works really gladdens my heart, which beats with devotion for the lofty and grand productions of this, our father of the science of harmony, and I trust I shall soon see them appear. I hope, when golden peace is proclaimed, and your subscription list opened, to procure you many subscribers here. Footnote 1. With regard to our own transactions, as you wish to know my proposals, they are as follows. I offer you, at present, the following works. The Septet, which I already wrote to you about, 20 ducats. Symphony, 20 ducats. Concerto, 10 ducats. Grand Solo Sonata, Allegro, Adagio, Menuetto, Rondo, 20 ducats. This sonata, Opus 22, is well up to the mark, my dear brother. Now, for explanations. You may perhaps be surprised that I make no difference of price between the sonata, septet, and symphony. I do so because I find that a septet or a symphony has not so great a sale as a sonata, though a symphony ought unquestionably to be of the most value. And b. The septet consists of a short introductory adagio, an allegro, adagio, minuetto, andante, with variations, Minuetto, and another short adagio preceding a presto. I only ask ten ducats for the concerto, for, as I already wrote to you, I do not consider it one of my best. I cannot think that, taken as a whole, you will consider these prices exorbitant. At least I have endeavored to make them as moderate as possible for you. With regard to the banker's draft, as you give me my choice, I beg you will make it payable by Gurmuller or Schuller. The entire sum for the four works will amount to 70 ducats. I understand no currency but Vienna ducats, so how many dollars in gold they make in your money is no affair of mine, for really I am a very bad man of business and accountant. Now this troublesome business is concluded. I call it so heartily, wishing that it could be otherwise here below. There ought to be only one grand depot of art in the world, to which the artist might repair with his works, and on presenting them receive what he required. But as it now is, one must be half a tradesman besides, and how is this to be endured? Good heavens, I may well call it troublesome. As for the Leipzig oxen, 
Footnote 2. Let them talk. They certainly will make no man immortal by their prating, and as little can they deprive of immortality those whom Apollo destines to attain it. Now may heaven preserve you and your colleagues. I have been unwell for some time, so it is rather difficult for me at present to write even music, much more letters. I trust we shall have frequent opportunities to assure each other how truly you are my friend, and I yours. I hope for a speedy answer. Adieu. L. V. Beethoven. Footnote 1. I have at this moment in my hands this edition of Bach, bound in one thick volume, together with the first part of Nigelli's edition of the Voltemprietis Clavier, also three books of exercises, D, G, and C minor, the Toccata in D minor, and twice fifteen inventions. Footnote 2. It is thus that Schindler supplies the gap. It is probably an allusion to the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, founded about three years previously. End of letter number 20. Letter number 21 to Herr Hofmeister. Vienna, April 22nd, 1801. You have indeed too good cause to complain not a little of me. My excuse is that I have been ill and in addition had so much to do that I could scarcely even think of what I was to send you. Moreover, the only thing in me that resembles a genius is that my papers are never in very good order, and yet no one but myself can succeed in arranging them. For instance, in the score of the concerto, the piano part, according to my usual custom, was not yet written down. So, owing to my hurry, you will receive it in my own very illegible writing. In order that the works may follow as nearly as possible in their proper order, I have marked the numbers to be placed on each as follows. Solo Sonata, Opus 22, Symphony, Opus 21, Septet, Opus 20, Concerto, Opus 19. I will send you their various titles shortly. Put me down as a subscriber to Sebastian Bach's works, and also Prince Lichnowsky. The arrangement of Mozart's sonatas as quartets will do you much credit, and no doubt be profitable also. I wish I could contribute more to the promotion of such an undertaking, but I am an irregular man, and too apt, even with the best intentions, to forget everything. I have, however, mentioned the matter to various people, and I everywhere find them well disposed towards it. It would be a good thing if you would arrange the septet you are about to publish as a quintet, with a flute part, for instance. This would be an advantage to amateurs of the flute, who have already importuned me on the subject, and who would swarm round it like insects and banquet on it. Now, to tell you something of myself, I have written a ballet, Prometheus, in which the ballet master has not done his part so well as might be. The F. Von L. has also bestowed on us a production which by no means corresponds with the ideas of his genius conveyed by the newspaper reports. F. seems to have taken Herr M., possibly Wenzel Muller, as his ideal at the Cusperle, yet without even rising to his level. Such are the fine prospects before us poor people who strive to struggle upwards. My dear friend, Pray lose no time in bringing the work before the notice of the public, and write to me soon, that I may know whether, by my delay, I have entirely forfeited your confidence for the future. Say all that is civil and kind to your partner, Kunal. Everything shall henceforth be sent finished, and in quick succession. So now, farewell, and continue your regards for your friend and brother, Beethoven. End of letter number 21 Letter number 22. To Herr Hofmeister. Vienna, June, 1801. I am rather surprised at the communication you have desired your business agent here to make to me. I may well feel offended at your believing me capable of so mean a trick. It would have been a very different thing had I sold my works to rapacious shopkeepers and then secretly made another good speculation. But from one artist to another... It is rather a strong measure to suspect me of such a proceeding. The whole thing seems to be either a device to put me to the test, or a mere suspicion. 
In any event, I may tell you that before you received the septet from me, I had sent it to Mr. Salomon in London to be played at his own concert, which I did solely from friendship, with the express injunction to beware of it getting into other hands, as it was my intention to have it engraved in Germany, and, if you choose, you can apply to him for the confirmation of this. But to give you a further proof of my integrity, quote, I herewith give you the faithful assurance that I have neither sold the septet, the symphony, the concerto, nor the sonata to any one but to Messrs. Hofmeister and Kuhnel, and that they may consider them to be their own exclusive property. And to this I pledge my honor, unquote. You may make what use you please of this guarantee. Moreover, I believe Salomon to be as incapable of the baseness of engraving the septet as I am of selling it to him. I was so scrupulous in the matter that when applied to by various publishers to sanction a pianoforte arrangement of the septet, I at once declined, though I do not even know whether you proposed making use of it in this way. Here follow the long-promised titles of the works. There will no doubt be a good deal to alter in, to amend in them, but this I leave to you. I shall soon expect a letter from you, and, I hope, the works likewise, which I wish to see engraved, as others have appeared and are about to appear in connection with these numbers. I look on your statement as founded on mere rumors, which you have believed with too much facility, or based entirely on supposition induced by having perchance heard that I had sent the work to Salomon. I cannot therefore but feel some coolness towards such a credulous friend, though I still subscribe myself, your friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 22. Letter number 25 to Herr Hofmeister, Leipzig, Vienna, April 8th, 1802. Do you mean to go post-haste to the devil, gentlemen, by proposing that I should write such a sonata? During the revolutionary fever, a thing of the kind might have been appropriate, but now, when everything is falling again into the beaten track, and Bonaparte has concluded a concordat with the Pope, such a sonata as this? If it were a Missa pro Sancta Maria Trevacci or a Vesper, then I would at once take up my pen and write a credo in unum in gigantic semibrevs. But good heavens, such a sonata in this fresh dawning Christian epic? No, no, it won't do, and I will have none of it. Now, for my answer in quickest tempo, the lady can have a sonata from me, and I am willing to adopt the general outlines of her plan in an aesthetical point of view, without adhering to the keys named. The price to be five ducats. For this sum, she can keep the work a year for her own amusement, without either of us being entitled to publish it. After the lapse of a year, the sonata to revert to me, that is, I can and will then publish it, when, if she considers it any distinction, she may request me to dedicate it to her. I now, gentlemen, commend you to the grace of God. My sonata, Opus 22, is well engraved, but you have been a fine time about it. I hope you will usher my septet into the world a little quicker, as the P is waiting for it. And you know the Empress has it, and when there are in this imperial city people like blank, name unknown or illegible, I cannot be answerable for the result. So lose no time. Herr Blank, possibly Molo, has lately published my quartets, Opus 18, full of faults and errata, both large and small, which swarm in them like fish in the sea. That is, they are innumerable. Questo è un piacere un autore. That is, what I call engraving, stushing, stinging, with a vengeance. Footnote 1. In truth, my skin is a mass of punctures and scratches from this fine edition of my quartets. Now farewell, and think of me as I do of you, till death, your faithful L. V. Beethoven. Footnote 1. In reference to the musical piracy at the time, very prevalent in Austria. End of letter number 25. Letter number 29. To Herr Hofmeister, Leipzig. Vienna, September 22, 1803. 
I hereby declare all the works you have ordered to be your property. The list of these shall be made out and sent to you with my signature, as the proof of their being your own. I also agree to accept the sum of fifty ducats for them. Are you satisfied? Perhaps instead of the variations with violoncello and violin, footnote one, I may send you variations for the piano, arranged as a duet on a song of mine. But Goethe's poetry must also be engraved, as I wrote these variations in an album, and consider them better than the others. Are you satisfied? The arrangements are not by me, though I have revised and much improved various passages, but I do not wish you to say that I have arranged them, for it would be false, and I have neither time nor patience to do so. Are you satisfied? Now farewell. I sincerely wish that all may go well with you. I would gladly make you a present of all my works, if I could do so and still get on in the world. But remember, most people are provided for and know what they have to live on. While, good heavens, where can an appointment be found at the imperial court for such a parvum talentum comego? Your friend, L. V. Beethoven. Footnote 1. These are the six variations in D on the air Ich Danke Dein, written in 1800 in the album of the Countesses Josephine Dame and Teresa of Brunswick. End of letter number 29. End of section 5 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar, Baltimore, Maryland, www.splungemusic.com. Section 6 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victor Guerrero. Selected Letters number 26 by Ludwig van Beethoven has compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 26, footnote 1. To my brothers Karl and Johann Beethoven, Heiligenstadt, October 6, 1802. O oh, ye you think or declare me to be hostile, morose, and misanthropical. How unjust you are, and how little you know the secret cause of what appears thus to you. My heart and mind were ever from childhood prone to the most tender feelings of affection, and I was always disposed to accomplish something great. But you must remember that six years ago I was attacked by an incurable malady, aggravated by unskillful physicians, deluded from year to year, too, by the hope of relief and at length forced to the conviction of a lasting affliction, the cure of which may go on for years and perhaps, after all, prove impracticable. Born with a passionate and excitable temperament, keenly susceptible to the pleasures of society, I was yet obliged early in life to isolate myself and to pass my existence in solitude. If I at any time resolved to surmount all this, oh, how cruelly was I again repelled by the experience, sadder than ever, of my defective earring. And yet, I found it impossible to say to others, Speak louder, shout, for I am deaf. Alas, how could I proclaim the deficiency of a sense which ought to have been more perfect with me than with other men, a sense which I once possessed in the highest perfection, to an extent indeed that few of my profession ever enjoyed? Alas, I cannot do this. Forgive me, therefore, when you see me withdraw from you with whom I would so gladly mingle. My misfortune is doubly severe from causing me to be misunderstood. No longer can I enjoy recreation in social intercourse, refined conversation, or mutual outpourings of thought. Completely isolated, I only enter society when compelled to do so. I must live like an exile. In company, I am assailed by the most painful apprehensions, from the dread of being exposed to the risk of my condition being observed. It was the same during the last six months I spent in the country. 
My intelligent physician recommended me to spare my hearing as much as possible, which was quite in accordance with my present disposition, though sometimes, tempted by my natural inclination for society, I allowed myself to be beguiled into it. But what humiliation when anyone beside me heard a flute in the far distance, while I heard nothing, or when others heard a shepherd singing, and I still heard nothing. Such things brought me to the verge of desperation, and well nigh caused me to put an end to my life. Art, art alone deterred me. Ah, how could I possibly quit the world before bringing forth all that I felt it was my vocation to produce? Footnote 2 And thus I spared this miserable life, so utterly miserable that any sudden change may reduce me at any moment from my best condition into the worse. It is decreed that I must now choose patience for my guide. This I have done. I hope the resolve will not fail me, steadfastly to persevere till it may please the inexorable fates to cut the thread of my life. Perhaps I may get better, perhaps not. I am prepared for either. Constrained to become a philosopher in my twenty-eighth year. Footnote 3 This is no slight trial, and more severe on an artist than on anyone else. God looks into my heart, he searches it, and knows that love for men and feelings of benevolence have their abode here. Oh, ye you may one day read this. Think that you have done me injustice, and let anyone similarly afflicted be consoled by finding one like himself, who in defiance of all the obstacles of nature has done all in his power to be included in the ranks of estimable artists and men. My brothers, Carl and Johan, as soon as I am no more, if Professor Schmidt be still alive, beg him in my name to describe my malady and to add these pages to the analysis of my disease, that at least, so far as possible, the world may be reconciled to me after my death. I also hereby declare you both heirs of my small fortune, if so it may be called. Share it fairly, agree together and assist each other. You know that anything you did to give me pain has been long forgiven. I thank you, my brother Carl in particular, for the attachment you have shown me of late. My wish is that you may enjoy a happier life and one more free from care than mine has been. Recommend virtue to your children. That alone, and not wealth, can ensure happiness. I speak from experience. It was virtue alone which sustained me in my misery. I have to thank her and art for not having ended my life by suicide. Farewell. Love each other. I gratefully thank all my friends, especially Prince Lichnovsky and Professor Schmidt. I wish one of you to keep Prince Els's instruments, but I trust this will give rise to no dissension between you. If you think it more beneficial, however, you have only to dispose of them. How much I shall rejoice if I can serve you even in the grave. So be it then. I joyfully hasten to meet death. If he comes before I have had the opportunity of developing all my artistic powers, then, notwithstanding my cruel fate, he will come too early for me, and I should wish for him at a more distant period. But even then I shall be content, for his advent will release me from a state of endless suffering. Come when he may, I shall meet him with courage. Farewell. Do not quite forget me, even in death. I deserve this from you, because during my life I so often thought of you and wished to make you happy. Amen. Ludwig van Beethoven Written on the outside To be read and fulfilled after my death by my brothers Karl and Johan Thus, then, I take leave of you, and with sadness, too. The fond hope I brought with me here of being to a certain degree cured now utterly forsakes me, as autumn leaves fall and wither 
so are my hopes blighted. Almost as I came, I depart. Even the lofty courage that so often animated me in the lovely days of summer is gone forever. O oh, Providence, vouchsafe me one day of pure felicity. How long have I been estranged from the glad echo of true joy? When, O oh my God, when shall I again feel it in the temple of nature and of man? Never. Ah, that would be too hard. Footnote 1. This beautiful letter I regret not to have seen in the original, it being in the possession of the villain virtuoso Ernst in London. I have adhered to the version given in the Leipzig Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, October 1827. Footnote 2. A large portion of the Eroica was written in the course of this summer, but not completed till August 1804. Footnote 3. Beethoven did not at that time know in what year he was born. See the subsequent letter of May the 2nd, 1810. He was then far advanced in his 33rd year. End of letter number 26. End of section 6 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Victor Guerrero. Section number seven of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit librivox.org. Recording by Squid Vajlakova. Selected Letters, number sixty six, sixty seven, and ninety three by Ludwig von Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace Letter number sixty six to Bettina Brentano Footnote number one Vienna, august eleventh, eighteen ten My dearest friend Never was there a lovelier spring than this year. I say so, and feel it too, because it was then I first knew you. You have yourself seen that in society I am like a fish on the sand, which writhes and writhes, but cannot get away till some benevolent Galatea casts it back into the mighty ocean. I was indeed fairly stranded, dearest friend, when surprised by you. At a moment in which moroseness had entirely mastered me, but how quickly it vanished at your aspect, I was at once conscious that you came from another sphere than this absurd world, where, with the best inclinations, I cannot open my ears. I am a wretched creature, and yet I complain of others. You will forgive this from the goodness of heart that beams in your eyes and the good sense manifested by your ears. At least they understand how to flatter, by the mode in which they listen. My ears are, alas, a partition wall, through which I can with difficulty hold any intercourse with my fellow creatures. Otherwise, perhaps, I might have felt more assured with you. But I was only conscious of the full, intelligent glance from your eyes, which affected me so deeply that never can I forget it. My dear friend, dearest girl, art? Who comprehends it? With whom can I discuss this mighty goddess? How precious to me were the few days when we talked together, or, I should rather say, corresponded. I have carefully preserved the little notes with your clever, charming, most charming answers, so I have to thank my defective hearing for the greater part of our fugitive intercourse being written down. Since you left this, I have had some unhappy hours, hours of the deepest gloom, when I could do nothing. I wandered for three hours in the Schönbrunn Allee, after you left us, but no angel met me there, 
to take possession of me as you did. Pray forgive, my dear friend, this deviation from the original key. But I must have such intervals as a relief to my heart. You have no doubt written to Goethe about me. I would gladly bury my head in a sack, so that I might neither see nor hear what goes on in the world, because I shall meet you there no more. But I shall get a letter from you? Hope sustains me, as it does half the world. Through life she has been my close companion. Or what would have become of me? I sent you, canst du das Land, written with my own hand, as a remembrance of the hour when I first knew you. I send you another that I composed since I bade you farewell, my dearest, fairest sweetheart. Herrs, mein Herrs, was soll das geben? Was bedrang it, dich so sehr? Welch ein neues fremdes Leben! Ich erkenne dich nicht mehr. Now answer me, my dearest friend, and say what is to become of me, since my heart has turned such a rebel. Write to your most faithful friend, Beethoven. Footnote number one. The celebrated letters to Bettina are given here exactly as published in her book, Ilius Pamphilius und Dib Ambrosia, Berlin, Arnhem, 1857, in two volumes. I never myself had any doubts of their being genuine, with the exception of perhaps some words in the middle of the third letter, nor can any one now distrust them, especially after the publication of Beethoven's letters. But for the sake of those for whom the weight of innate conviction is not sufficient proof, I may here mention that in December 1864, Professor Moritz Carriere, in Munich, when conversing with me about Beethoven's letters, expressly assured me that these three letters were genuine, and that he had seen them in Berlin at Bettina von Arnim's in 1839, and read them most attentively and with the deepest interest. From their important contents, he urged their immediate publication, and when this shortly after ensued, no change whatever struck him as having been made in the original text. On the contrary, he still perfectly remembered that the much disputed phraseology, and especially the incident with Goethe, was precisely the same as in the originals. This testimony seems to me the more weighty, as Monsieur Carriere must not in such matters be looked on as a novice, but as a competent judge who has carefully studied all that concerns our literary heroes, and who would not permit anything to be falsely imputed to Beethoven, any more than to Goethe. Beethoven's biography is, however, the proper place to discuss more closely such things, especially his character and his conduct in this particular case. At present we only refer, in general terms, to the first chapter of Beethoven's Jugend, which gives all the facts connected with these letters to Bettina, and the following ones. A characteristic likeness of Beethoven thus impressed itself on the mind of the biographer, and was reproduced in a few bold outlines in his biography. These letters could not, however, possibly be given in extenso in a general introduction to a comprehensive biography. End of letter number 66 Letter number 67 to Bettina Brentano, Vienna, February 10th, 1811. Dear and beloved friend, I have now received two letters from you, while those to Tony show that you still remember me, and even too kindly. I carried your letter about with me the whole summer, and it often made me feel very happy, though I do not frequently write to you and you never see me. Still I write you letters by thousands in my thoughts. I can easily imagine what you feel at Berlin, in witnessing all the noxious frivolity of the world's rabble. Footnote 1. Even had you not written it to me yourself. Such prating about art, and yet no results. The best description of this is to be found in Schiller's poem, Die Flusse, 
where the river Spree is supposed to speak. You are going to be married, my dear friend, or already so, and I have had no chance of seeing you even once previously. May all the felicity that marriage ever bestowed on husband and wife attend you both. What can I say to you of myself? I can only exclaim with Joanna, Compassionate my fate! If I am spared for some years to come, I will thank the omniscient, the omnipotent, for the boon, as I do for all other weal and woe. If you mention me when you write to Goethe, strive to find words expressive of my deep reverence and admiration. I am about to write to him myself with regard to Egmont, for which I have written some music solely for my love for his poetry, which also delights me. Who can be sufficiently grateful to a great poet, the most precious jewel of a nation? Now no more, my dear sweet friend. I only come home this morning at four o'clock from an orgy, where I laughed heartily. But today I feel as if I could weep as sadly. Turbulent pleasures always violently recoil on my spirits. As for Clemens, note, Brentano, her brother, and note, Pray thank him for his complaisance, with regard to the cantata. The subject is not important enough for us here. It is very different in Berlin, and as for my affection, the sister engrosses so large a share, the little remains for the brother. Will he be content with this? Now farewell, my dear, dear friend. I imprint a sorrowful kiss on your forehead, thus impressing my thoughts on it as with a seal. Write soon, very soon, to your brother. Beethoven Footnote 1 An expression which, as well as many others, he no doubt borrowed from Bettina, and introduced to please her. End of letter number 67 Letter number 93 To Bettina von Arnim Toplitz, August fifteenth, 1812 my most dear, kind friend, Kings and princes can indeed create professors and privy councillors, and confer titles and decorations, but they cannot make great men, spirits that soar above the base turmoil of this world. There their powers fail, and this it is that forces them to respect us. Footnote number one. When two persons like Goethe and myself meet, these grandees cannot fail to perceive what such as we consider great. Yesterday, on our way home, we met the whole imperial family. We saw them coming some way off. When Goethe withdrew his arm from mine, in order to stand aside, and, say what I would, I could not prevail on him to make another step in advance. I pressed down my hat more firmly on my head, buttoned up my great coat, and, crossing my arms behind me, I made my way through the thickest portion of the crowd. Princes and courtiers formed a lane for me. Archduke Rudolph took off his hat, and the Empress bowed to me first. These great ones of the earth know me. To my infinite amusement I saw the procession defile past Goethe, who stood aside with his hat off, bowing profoundly. I afterwards took him sharply to task for this. I gave him no quarter, and upbraided him with all his sins, especially towards you, my dear friend, as we had just been speaking of you. Heavens! If I could have lived with you as he did, believe me, I should have produced far greater things. A musician is also a poet. He too can feel himself transported into a brighter world by a pair of fine eyes, where loftier spirits sport with him and impose heavy tasks on him. What thoughts rushed into my mind? when I first saw you at the observatory during a refreshing May shower. So fertilizing to me also. Footnote number two. The most beautiful themes stole from your eyes into my heart, which shall yet enchant the world when Beethoven no longer directs. If God vouchsafes to grant me a few more years of life, I must then see you once more, my dear, most dear friend, for the voice within to which I always listen demands this. Spirits may love one another, and I shall ever woo yours. Your approval is dearer to me than all else in the world. 
I told Goethe my sentiments, as to the influence praise has over men like us, and that we desire our equals to listen to us with their understanding. Emotion suits women only. Forgive me. Music ought to strike fire from the soul of man. Ah, my dear girl, how long have our feelings been identical on all points? The sole real good is some bright, kindly spirit to sympathize with us, whom we thoroughly comprehend, and from whom we need not hide our thoughts. He who wishes to appear something must in reality be something. The world must acknowledge us. It is not always unjust. But for this I care not, having a higher purpose in view. I hope to get a letter from you in Vienna. Write to me soon and fully, for a week hence I shall be there. The court leaves this to-morrow, and to-day they have another performance. The Empress has studied her part thoroughly. The Emperor and the Duke wished me to play some of my own music, but I refused, for they are both infatuated with Chinese porcelain. A little indulgence is required, for reason seems to have lost its empire. But I do not choose to minister to such perverse folly. I will not be a party to such absurd doings to please those princes, who are constantly guilty of eccentricities of this sort. Adieu, adieu, dear one. Your letter lay all night next to my heart, and cheered me. Musicians permit themselves great license. Heavens, how I love you! Your most faithful friend and deaf brother, Beethoven. Footnote number one. Fraulein Giantasio del Rio, in the journal she sent to the Grand's Boten in 1857, states that Beethoven once declared, It is very pleasant to associate with the great of the earth, but one must possess some quality which inspires them with respect. Footnote number two. According to Bettina, note, see Goethe's correspondence with the child, volume two, 193. And note, their first acquaintance was made in Beethoven's apartments. End of letter number ninety three. End of section number seven of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Squid Vajlakova. Found at frisco squid.blogspot.com. Section 8 of Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Robert Scott. Selected Letters, number 127, by Ludwig van Beethoven as compiled with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 127, Deposition, 1814 I voluntarily presented Malzell gratis with a battle symphony for his panharmonic. After having kept it for some time, he brought me back the score which he had already begun to engrave, saying that he wished it to be harmonized for a full orchestra. The idea of a battle had already occurred to me, which, however, could not be performed on his panharmonic. We agreed to select this and some more of my works to be given at the concert for the benefit of disabled soldiers. At that very time, I became involved in the most frightful pecuniary difficulties, forsaken by everyone in Vienna, and in daily expectation of remittances. Malzell offered me fifty gold ducats, which I accepted, saying that I would either repay them or allow him to take the work to London, provided that I did not go there myself with him, referring him to an English publisher for payment. I got back from him the score written for the Panharmonic. The concerts then took place, and during that time Herr Malzell's designs and character 
were first fully revealed. Without my consent, he stated on the bills of concert that the work was his property. Indignant at this, I insisted on destroying these bills. He then stated that I had given it to him as a friendly act, because he was going to London. To this I did not object, believing that I had reserved the right to state the conditions on which the work should be his own. I remember that when the bills were being printed, I violently opposed them, but the time was short, and I was still writing the work. In all the fire of inspiration, and absorbed in my composition, I scarcely thought at all on the subject. Immediately after the first concert in the University Hall, I was told on all sides, and by people whom I could rely, that Malzell had everywhere given out he had paid me four hundred gold ducats for the symphony. I sent what follows to a newspaper, but the editor would not insert it, as Malzell stands well with them all. As soon as the first concert was over, I repaid Malzell his fifty ducats, declaring that having discovered his real character, nothing should ever induce me to travel with him. Justly indignant, that without consulting me, he had stated in the bills that all the arrangements for the concert were most effective. His own despicable want of patriotism, too, is proved by the following expressions. Quote, I care nothing at all about London. If it is only to say, in London, that people have paid ten gilden for admission here, that is all I care about. The wounded are nothing to me. End quote. Moreover, I told him that he might take the work to London on certain conditions, which I would inform him of. He then asserted that it was a friendly gift and made use of this phrase in the newspapers after the second concert, without giving me the most remote hint on the subject. As Malzell is a rude, curlish man, entirely devoid of education or cultivation, it is easy to conceive the tenor of his conduct to me during this time, which still further irritated me. Who could bear to be forced to bestow a friendly gift on such a man? I was offered an opportunity to send the work to the Prince Regent. Note, afterwards, George the Fourth. It was therefore quite impossible for me to give away the work unconditionally. He then called on a mutual friend to make proposals. He was told on what day to return for an answer but he never appeared, set off on his travels, and performed the work in Munich. How did he obtain it? He could not possibly steal it, but Herr Malzell had several of the parts for some days in his house, and he caused the entire work to be harmonized by some obscure musical journeyman, and is now hawking it about the world. Herr Malzell promised me ear trumpets, I harmonized the battle symphony for his panharmonic from a wish to keep him to his word. The ear trumpets came at last, but were not of the service to me that I expected. For this slight trouble, Herr Malzell, after my having arranged the battle symphony for a full orchestra and composed a battle piece in addition, declared that I ought to have made over these works to him as his own exclusive property. Even allowing that I am in some degree obliged to him for the ear trumpets, this is entirely balanced by his having made at least five hundred gilden in Munich by my mutilated or stolen battle piece. He has therefore paid himself in full. He had actually the audacity to say here that he was in possession of the battle piece. In fact, he showed it, written out to various persons. 
I did not believe this, and in fact, with good reason, as the whole is not by me, but compelled by someone else. Indeed, the credit he assumes for the work should alone be sufficient compensation. The secretary at the war office made no allusions whatever to me, and yet every work performed at both concerts was of my composition. Herr Malzell thinks fit to say that he has delayed his visit to London on account of the battle piece, which is a mere subterfuge. He stayed to finish his patchwork, as the first attempt did not succeed. Beethoven End of letter 127. End of section 8. Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recorded by Robert Scott, June the 20th. Section 9 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, Numbers 128 and 130. Goodbye, Van Haozi. Letters 140, 141, and 142. Recording by Victor Guerrero. Letters 145, 148, 149, 150, and 186. Read by Scott Farquhar. Letter number 128. To hear J. Kalka, Doctor of Laos in Prague, in the Kingdom of Bohemia, the summer of 1814. A thousand thanks, my esteemed Kalka. At last I meet with a legal representative and a man who can both write and think without using and meaning formulas. You can scarcely imagine how I long for the end of this affair as it not only interferes with my domestic expenditure, but is injurious to me in various ways. You know yourself that the sensitive spirit are not to be fettered by miserable anxieties, and much that my render my life happy is thus abstracted from it. Even my inclination and the duty assigned myself to serve suffering humanity by means of my art. I have been obliged to leave it, and must continue to do so. Footnote 1 you write nothing about our monarchs and monarchies, for the newspapers give you every information on these subjects. Footnote 2 The intellectual realm is the most precious in my eyes, and far above all temporal and spiritual monarchies. Write to me, however, what you wish for yourself from my poor musical capabilities, that I may, in so far as it lies in my power, supply something for your own musical sense and feeling. Do you now require all the papers connected with the Kinski case? If so, I will send them to you, as they contain most important testimony, which indeed I believe you read when with me. Think of me and do not forget that you represent a disinterested artist in your position to a niggly family. How gladly do men withhold from the poor artist in one respect what they pay him another, and there is no longer a those with whom an artist can invite himself to feast on ambrosia. Strive, my dear friend, to serve the tardy steps of justice, whenever I feel myself elevated high, and in happy moments rival in my artistic sphere, circumstance struck me down again, not more than these two lousies. You too have your disagreeable moments, though with the views and the capabilities I know you to possess, especially in your profession. I could scarcely have believed this. Still, I must recall your attention to myself. I have drunk to the dregs a cup of bitter sorrow, and already earned Marty Dominard through my beloved artistic disciples and colleagues. I beg you will think of me every day, and imagine it to be an entire world, for it is really asking rather too much of you to think of so humble an individual as myself. I am, with the highest esteem and friendship, your obedient, Ludwig van Beethoven. Footnote 1. He supported the consumptive brother and his wife and child. Footnote 2. At the Vienna Congress, Beethoven was received with much distinction by the potentates present. End of letter number 128. Letter number 130. To Dr. Kalka. Vienna, 
August 22, 1814. You have shown a feeling for harmony, and you can resolve a great disorder in my life, which causes me much discomfort in a more pleasing melody, if you will. I shall expect to hear something of what you understand is likely to happen, as I eagerly anticipate the result of this most unjust affair with the Kinskis. When the princess was here, she seemed to be well disposed towards me. Still, I do not know how it will end. In the meantime, I must restrict myself in everything and wait with the entire confidence what is rightfully my own and legally devolves on me. And though unforeseen occurrences cause the change in this matter, still two witnesses recently bore testimony to the wish of the deceased prince that my appointed salary in Bacazetto should be paid in low sunshine, making up the original sum, and the prince himself gave me sixty gold ducats on account of my claim. Should the affair turn out badly for me by the conduct of the Kinski family, I will publish it in every newspaper to their disgrace. If there had been an heir, and the facts had been told to him in all their truth, just as I narrated them, I am convinced that he would at once have dubbed the word and deeds of his predecessor. Has Dr. Wolf, the previous advocate, shown you the papers, or shall I make you acquainted with them? As I am by no means sure that this letter will reach you safely, I defer sending you the pianoforte arrangement of my opera Fidelio, which is ready to be dispatched. I hope, in accordance with your usual friendliness, soon to hear from you. I am also writing to Dr. Wolf, who certainly does not treat anyone wolfishly, in order now to arouse his passion, so that he may have compassion on me, and neither take my purse nor my life. I am, with esteem, your true friend, Ludwig van Beethoven. End of letter number 130. Letter number 140. To R. Kauka. Vienna. January 11, 1815 My good, worthy K, I received Baron Pasqualati's letter today, by which I perceive that you wish me to defer any fresh measures. In the meantime, all the necessary papers are lodged with Pasqualati, so be so good as to inform him that he must delay taking any further steps. Tomorrow, a council is to be held here, and you and P shall learn the result, probably tomorrow evening. Meanwhile, I wish you to look through the paper I sent to the court through Pasqualati, and read the appendix carefully. You will then see that Wolf and others have not given you correct information. One thing is certain, that there are sufficient proofs for anyone who wishes to be convinced. How could it ever occur to me to think of written legal testimony with such a man as Kinsky, whose integrity and generosity were everywhere acknowledged? I remain, with the warmest affection and esteem, in haste, your friend, B. End of letter number 140. Letter number 141. To R. Kauke. 1815. My dear and esteemed K, what can I think, or say, or feel? As for W, it seems to me that he not only showed his weak points, but gave himself no trouble to conceal them. It is impossible that he can have drawn up his statement in accordance with all the actual evidence he had. The order on the treasury about the rate of exchange was given by Kinski previous to his consent to pay me my salary in Einlösungsschein, as the documents prove. Indeed, it is only necessary to examine the date to show this, so the first instruction is of importance. The specious facti prove that I was more than six months absent from Vienna. As I was not anxious to get the money, I allowed the affair to stand over, so the prince thus forgot to recall his former order to the treasury. But that he neither forgot his promise to me, nor to Varnhagen, in my behalf, is evident by the testimony of Herr von Olive, to whom shortly before his departure from hence, and indeed into another world, he repeated his promise, making an appointment to see him when he should return to Vienna, in order to arrange the matter with the treasury, which, of course, was prevented by his untimely death. 
The testimony of the officer Varnhagen is accompanied by a document, he being at present with the Russian army, in which he states that he is prepared to take his oath on the affair. The evidence of Herr Olive is also to the effect that he is willing to confirm his evidence by oath before the court. As I have sent away the testimony of Colonel Count Bentheim, I am not sure of its tenor, but I believe the Count also says that he is prepared at any time to make an affidavit on the matter in court. And I am myself ready to swear before the court that Prince Kinski said to me in Prague, he thought it only fair to me that my salary should be paid in Einlösungsschein. These were his own words. He gave me himself sixty gold ducats in Prague, on account good for about six hundred florins, as, owing to my state of health, I could remain no longer and set off for Toplitz. The prince's word was sacred in my eyes, never having heard anything of him to induce me either to bring two witnesses with me or to ask him for any written pledge. I see from all this that Dr. Wolf has miserably mismanaged the business and has not made you sufficiently acquainted with the papers. Now as to the step I have just taken, the Archduke Rudolf asked me some time since whether the Kinski affair was yet terminated, having probably heard something of it. I told him that it looked very bad, as I knew nothing, absolutely nothing, of the matter. He offered to write himself, but desired me to add a memorandum, and also to make him acquainted with all the papers connected with the Kinski case. After having informed himself on the affair, he wrote to the Oberstburggraf and enclosed my letter to him. The Oberstburggraf answered both the Duke and myself immediately. In the letter to me he said that I was to present a petition to the Provincial Court of Justice in Prague along with all the proofs whence it would be forwarded to him, and that he would do his utmost to further my cause. He also wrote in the most polite terms to the Archduke. Indeed, he expressly said that he was truly cognizant of the late Prince Kinski's intentions with regard to me and this affair, and that I might present a petition. The Archduke instantly sent for me, and desired me to prepare the document and to show it to him. He also thought that I ought to solicit payment in Ein Losungsschein, as there was ample proof, if not in strictly legal form, of the intentions of the prince, and no one could doubt that if he had survived, he would have adhered to his promise. If he were this day the heir, he would demand no other proofs than those already furnished. I sent this paper to Baron Pasqualati, who is kindly to present it himself to the court. Not till after the affair had gone so far did Dr. Adlersberg receive a letter from Dr. Wolf in which he mentioned that he had made a claim for 1,500 florins. As we have come so far as 1,500 florins with the Oberstburggraf, we may possibly get on to 1,800 florins. I do not esteem this any favor, for the late prince was one of those who urged me most to refuse a salary of 600 gold ducats per annum offered to me from Westphalia. And he said at the time, that he was resolved I should have no chance of eating hams in Westphalia. Another summons to Naples, somewhat later I equally declined, and I am entitled to demand a fair compensation for the loss I incurred. If the salary were to be paid in banknotes, what should I get? Not for a hundred florins in Convention's Guild, in lieu of such a salary as six hundred ducats. There are ample proofs for those who wish to act justly, and what does the Einlösungsschein now amount to? It is even at this moment no equivalent for what I refused. This affair was pompously announced in all the newspapers while I was nearly reduced to beggary. The intentions of the prince are evident, and in my opinion the family are bound to act in accordance with them unless they wish to be disgraced. Besides, the revenues have rather increased than diminished by the death of the prince, so there is no sufficient ground for curtailing my salary. I received your friendly letter yesterday, but I am too weary at this moment to write all that I feel towards you. I can only commend my case to your sagacity. It appears that the Oberstburggraf is the chief person, so what you wrote to the Archduke must be kept a profound secret, for it might not be advisable that anyone should know of it but you and Pasqualati. You have sufficient cause on looking through the papers to show how improperly Dr. Wolf has conducted the affair, and that another course of action is necessary. I rely on your friendship to act as you think best for my interests. Rest assured of my warmest thanks, and pray excuse my writing more today, for a thing of this kind is very fatiguing, more so than the greatest musical undertaking. My heart has found something for you to which yours will respond, 
and this you shall soon receive. Do not forget me, poor tormented creature that I am, and act for me, and effect for me all that is possible. With high esteem, your true friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 141 Letter number 142 To Air Kauka, Vienna, January 14, 1815 My good and worthy K. The long letter I enclose was written when we were disposed to claim the 1800 florins. Baron Pasqualati's last letter, however, again made me waver, and Dr. Adelsberg advised me to adhere to the steps already taken. But as Dr. Wolf writes that he has offered in your name to accept 1500 florins a year, I beg you will at least make every effort to get that sum. For this purpose, I send you the long letter written before we received Baron P.'s dissuasive one, as you may discover in it many reasons for demanding at least the 1500 florins. The Archduke, too, has written a second time to the Oberstburggraf, and we may conclude from this previous reply that he will certainly exert himself, and that we shall at all events succeed in getting the 1500 florins. Farewell. I cannot write another syllable. Such things exhaust me. May your friendship accelerate this affair. If it ends badly, then I must leave Vienna, because I could not possibly live on my income. For here things have come to such a pass that everything has risen to the highest price, and that price must be paid. The last two concerts I gave cost me 1,508 florins, and had it not been for the Empress's munificent present, I should scarcely have derived any profit whatever. Your faithful friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 142. Letter number 145. To Herr Kalka. Vienna, February 24th, 1815. My much esteemed K. I have repeatedly thanked you through Baron Pasqualati for your friendly exertions on my behalf, and I now beg to express one thousand thanks myself. The intervention of the Archduke could not be very palatable to you, and perhaps has prejudiced you against me. You have already done all that was possible when the Archduke interfered. If this had been the case sooner, and we had not employed that one-sided or many-sided or weak-sided Dr. Wolf, then, according to the assurances of the Oberstbuchgraf himself, the affair might have had a still more favorable result. I shall therefore ever and always be grateful to you for your services. The court now deduct the sixty ducats I mentioned of my own accord and to which the late prince never alluded either to his treasurer or any one else. Where truth could injure me, it has been accepted, and so why reject it when it could have benefited me? How unfair! Baron Pasqualati requires information from you on various points. I am again very tired today, having been obliged to discuss many things with poor P., such matters exhaust me more than the greatest efforts in composition. It is a new field, the soil of which I ought not to be required to till. This painful business has cost me many tears and much sorrow. The time draws near when Princess Kinsky must be written to. Now I must conclude. How rejoiced shall I be when I can write you the pure effusions of my heart once more and this I mean to do as soon as I am extricated from all these troubles. Pray accept again my heartfelt thanks for all that you have done for me, and continue your regard for your attached friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 145. Letter number 148. To Herr Kalka, Vienna, April 8, 1815. It seems scarcely admissible to be on the friendly terms on which I consider myself with you, and yet to be on such unfriendly ones that we should live close to each other and never meet. Footnote 1. You write tout à vous. Oh, you humbug, said I. No, no, it is really too bad. I should like to thank you nine thousand times for all your efforts on my behalf, and to reproach you twenty thousand that you came and went as you did. 
So all is a delusion. Friendship, kingdom, empire. All is only a vapor which every breeze wafts into a different form. Perhaps I may go to Toplitz, but it is not certain. I might take advantage of that opportunity to let the people of Prague hear something. What think you? If, indeed, you still think of me at all, as the affair with Lapkowitz is now almost come to a close, we may write Finney, though it far from fine is for me. Baron Pasqualati will no doubt soon call on you again. He also has taken much trouble on my account. Yes, indeed. It is easy to talk of justice, but to obtain it from others is no easy matter. In what way can I be of service to you in my own art? Say whether you prefer my celebrating the monologue of a fugitive king, or the perjury of a usurper, or the true friends who, though near neighbors, never saw each other? In the hope of soon hearing from you, for being now so far asunder it is easier to hold intercourse than when nearer, I remain with highest esteem your ever-devoted friend, Ludwig von Beethoven. Footnote 1. Kauka evidently had been recently in Vienna without visiting Beethoven. End of letter number 148. Letter number 149. To Herr Kauka. 1815. My dear and worthy K, I have just received from the syndic Bayer in R the good news that you told him yourself about Prince F. K. As for the rest, you shall be perfectly satisfied. I take the liberty to ask you again to look after my interests with the Kinsky family, and I sojourn the necessary receipt for this purpose. See number 144. Perhaps some other way may be found, though it does not as yet occur to me, by means of which I need not importune you in future. On the 15th of October, 1815, I was attacked by an inflammatory cold, from the consequences of which I still suffer, and my art likewise. But it is to be hoped that I shall now gradually recover, and at all events be able once more to display the riches of my little realm of sweet sounds. Yet I am very poor in all else, owing to the times, to poverty of spirit, or what? Farewell. Everything around disposes us to profound silence, but this shall not be the case as to the bond of friendship and soul that unites us. I loudly proclaim myself, now as ever, your loving friend and admirer, Beethoven. End of letter number 149. Letter number 150. To Herr Kauka. 1815. My most worthy friend, my second letter follows that of yesterday, May 2nd. Pasqualati tells me today, after the lapse of a month and six days, that the house of Balabane is too high and mighty to assist me in this matter. I must therefore appeal to your insignificance, as I myself do not hesitate to be so mean as to serve other people. My house rent amounts to 550 florins, and must be paid out of the sum in question. As soon as the newly engraved pianoforte pieces appear, you shall receive copies, and also of the battle. Forgive me, forgive me, my generous friend. Some other means must be found to forward this affair with due promptitude. In haste, your friend and admirer, Beethoven. End of letter number 150. Letter number 186. To Herr Kalka. Baden, September 16th, 1816. My worthy K, I send you herewith the receipt according to your request, and beg that you will kindly arrange that I should have the money by the 1st of October, and without any deduction, which has hitherto been the case. I also particularly beg you will not assign the money to Baron P. I will tell you why when we meet. For the present, let this remain between ourselves." Send it either direct to myself, or, if it must come through another person, do not let it be Baron P. It would be best for the future, as the house rent is paid here for the great house belonging to Kinsky, that my money should be paid at the same time. This is only my own idea. The Terzay you heard of will soon be engraved. 
which is infinitely preferable to all written music, you shall therefore receive an engraved copy, and likewise some more of my unruly offspring. In the meantime, I beg that you will see only what is truly good in them, and look with an indulgent eye on the human frailties of these poor innocents. Besides, I am full of cares, being in reality father to my late brother's child. Indeed, I might have ushered into the world a second part of the Flauto Magico, having also been brought into contact with a Queen of the Night. I embrace you from my heart, and hope soon in so far to succeed that you may owe some thanks to my muse. My dear, worthy Kalka, I ever am your truly attached friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 186 End of section 9 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Section 10 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Scott. Selected Letters, number 151, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 151, to Mr. Solomon, London, footnote 1. Vienna, June 1, 1815. My good fellow, countrymen, I always hope to meet you one day in London, but many obstacles have intervened to prevent the fulfillment of this wish, and as there seems now no chance of such a thing, I hope you will not refuse a request of mine, which is that you will be so obliging as to apply to some London publisher and offer him the following works of mine. Grand Trio for Piano, Violin, and violon cello, opus ninety seven, eighty ducats, pianoforte sonata with violin accompaniment, opus ninety six, sixty ducats, grand symphony in A, one of my very best, a short symphony in F, the eighth, quartet for two violins, viola, and violon cello, in F minor. Opus 95, Grand Opera in Score, 30 Ducats. Cantata with Choruses and Solos, The Glorious Moment, 30 Ducats. Scoring of the Battle of Vittoria and Wellington's Victory, 80 Ducats. Also, the Pianoforte arrangement of the same, if not already published, which, I am told here, is the case. I have named the prices of some of these works on a scale which I hold to be suitable for England, but I leave it to you to say what sum should be asked, both for these and the others. I hear indeed that Kramer is also a publisher. Note, this is John Kramer, whose piano fort playing was highly estimated by Beethoven. But my scholar, Rise, lately wrote to me that Kramer had not long since publicly expressed his disapproval of my works. I trust from no motive but that of being of service to art, and if so, I have no right to object to his doing this. If, however, Kramer should wish to possess any of my pernicious works, I shall be as well satisfied with him as with any other publisher, but I reserve the right to give these works to be published here, so that they may appear at the same moment in London and Vienna. Perhaps you may also be able to point out to me in what way I can recover from the Prince Regent, note, afterwards, George the Fourth. The expenses of transcribing the Battle Symphony on Wellington's victory at Vittoria to be dedicated to him, 
for I have long ago given up all hope of receiving anything from that quarter. I have not even been deemed worthy of an answer whether I am to be authorized to dedicate the work to the Prince Regent. And, when at last I propose to publish it here, I am informed that it has already appeared in London. What a fatality for an author! While the English and German papers are filled with accounts of the success of the work as performed at Drury Lane, and that theatre drawing great receipts from it, the author has not one friendly line to show, not even payment for the cost of copying the work, and is thus deprived of all profit. Footnote 2. For if it be true that the pianoforte arrangement is soon to be published by a German publisher, copied from the London one, then I lose both my fame and my honorarium. The well-known generosity of your character leads me to hope that you will take some interest in the matter, and actively exert yourself on my behalf. The inferior paper money of this country is now reduced to one-fifth of its value, and I am paid according to this scale. After many struggles and considerable loss, I at length succeeded in obtaining the full value. But at this moment the old paper money has again risen far beyond the fifth part, so that it is evident my salary becomes, for the second time, almost nil, and there is no hope of any compensation. My whole income is derived from my works. If I could rely on a good sale in England, it would doubtless be very beneficial to me. Pray, be assured of my boundless gratitude. I hope soon, very soon, to hear from you. I am, with esteem, your sincere friend, Ludwig von Beethoven. Footnote 1. J. P. Solomon was likewise a native of Bonn, and one of the most distinguished violin players of his time. He had been Kapellmeister to Prince Heinrich of Prussia, and then went to London, where he was very active in the introduction of German music. It was through his agency that Beethoven's connection with Birchall, the music publisher, first commenced, to whom a number of his letters are addressed. Footnote 2. Undoubtedly the true reading of these words, which in the copy before me are marked as difficult to decipher. End of letter number 151. End of section 10 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled, and with footnotes, by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Robert Scott, June the 18th, Section 11 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Robert Scott Selected Letters Number 162 by Ludwig von Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace Letter Number 162 To Rise Vienna Wednesday, November the 22nd 1815 I hasten to apprise you that I have today forwarded by post the pianoforte arrangement of the symphony in A, to the care of Messrs. Coots. As the court is absent, few indeed, almost no carriers, go from here. Moreover, the post is the safest way. The symphony ought to be brought out about March. The precise day I will fix myself. So much time has already been lost on this occasion that I could not give an earlier notice of the period of publication. The trio and the violin sonata may be allowed more time, and both will be in London a few weeks hence. I earnestly entreat you, dear Rise, 
to take charge of these matters, and also to see that I get the money. I require it, and it costs me a good deal before all is sent off. I have lost six hundred florins of my yearly salary. At the time of the banknotes there was no loss, but then came the Ein Losungschein, note, reduced paper money, which deprives me of these six hundred florins. After entailing on me several years of annoyance, and now the total loss of my salary. We are at present arrived at a point when the Einlosenschung are even lower than the banknotes ever were. I pay one thousand florins for house rent. You may thus conceive all the misery caused by paper money. My poor unhappy brother, note Karl von Beethoven, a cashier in Vienna, is just dead. Note, November 15th, 1815. He had a bad wife. For some years past, he has been suffering from consumption, and from my wish to make his life less irksome, I may compute what I gave him at 10,000 florins. Note, Viner Varung. This indeed does not seem much to an Englishman, but it is a great deal for a poor German or rather Austrian. The unhappy man was latterly much changed, and I must say I lament him from my heart, though I rejoice to think I left nothing undone that could contribute to his comfort. Tell Mr. Birchall that he is to repay the postage of my letters to you and Mr. Solomon, and also yours to me. He may deduct this from the sum he owes me. I am anxious that those who work for me shall lose as little as possible by it. Quote, Wellington's victory at Vittoria, end quote, footnote one to follow, must have arrived long ago, through the Messrs. Coots. Mr. Burkall need not send payment till he is in possession of all the works. Only do not delay letting me know when the day is fixed for publication of the pianoforte arrangement. For today, I only further earnestly recommend my affairs to your care. I shall be equally at your service at any time. Farewell, dear Rise. Your friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Quote, this is also to be the title of the piano fort arrangement. Note by Beethoven. End of letter 162. End of section 11 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Robert Scott, June the 29th. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Section 12 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gesine. Selected Letters, Numbers 212, 213, and 214, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Null, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter Number 212 To S. R. Steiner, Music Publisher, Vienna Highest Born, Most Admirable, and Marvellous Lieutenant General Footnote. Beethoven styled himself Generalissimus, Herr R. Steiner, Lieutenant General, and his partner, Tobias Hasslinger, Adjutant and Adjutant General. End of footnote. We beg you to give us banknotes for twenty-four gold ducats, 
at yesterday's rate of exchange, and to send them to us this evening or to-morrow, in order that we may forthwith remit and transmit them. I should be glad and happy if your trustworthy adjutant were to bring me these, as I have something particular to say to him. He must forget all his resentment like a good Christian. We acknowledge his merits and do not contest his demerits. In short, and once for all, we wish to see him. This evening would suit us best. We have the honour to remain, most astounding Lieutenant-General, your devoted Generalissimus. End of letter number 212 Letter number 213 To Lieutenant-General von Steiner Private Publicandum After due consideration, and by the advice of our Council, we have determined and decreed that henceforth on all our works published with German titles, the word Pianoforte is to be replaced by that of Hammerklavier, and our worthy Lieutenant-General, his adjutant, and all whom it may concern, are charged with the execution of this order. Instead of Pianoforte, Hammerklavier. Such is our will and pleasure. Given on the 23rd of January, 1817, by the Generalissimus. Manu propria. End of letter number 213. Letter number 214. To Steiner. The following dedication occurred to me of my new sonata. Sonata for the pianoforte, or Hammerklavier. Composed and dedicated to Frau Baronin Dorothea Erdmann, née Graumann, by Ludwig van Beethoven. If the title is already engraved, I have the following proposals to make, viz., that I pay for one title, I mean that it should be at my expense, or reserved for another new sonata of mine, for which purpose the minds of the Lieutenant-General, or pleno titulo, Lieutenant-General and First Councillor of State, must be opened to usher it into the light of day. The title is to be previously shown to a good linguist. Hammerklavier is certainly German, and so is the device. Honour to whom honour is due. How is it, then, that I have as yet received no reports of the carrying out of my orders, which, however, have no doubt been attended to? Ever and always you're attached, amicus at amicum de amico. N.B. I beg you will observe the most profound silence about the dedication, as I wish it to be a surprise. End of letter number 214 End of section 12 of Selected Letters of Beethoven As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Nohl and translated by Lady Grace Wallace Section 13 of Selected Letters of Beethoven This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Stephen H. Wilson Selected Letters, Number 281, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter Number 281, Petition to the Magistracy, Footnote 1. October 30th, 1819. Gentlemen, my brother, Karl van Beethoven, died on November 5th, 1815, leaving a boy twelve years old, his son Karl. In his will, by Clause 5, he bequeathed to me the guardianship of the boy, and in the codicil B, he expressed a wish that his widow, Johanna, should have a share in this duty, adding that, for the sake of his child, he recommended her to submit to my guidance. This explicit declaration of the father, added to my legal claim, I being the nearest relative, Clause 198, entitles me clearly to the guardianship of my nephew, Karl van Beethoven, and the Court of Justice, by their decree E, committed to me under existing circumstances the guardianship to the exclusion, moreover, of Beethoven's widow. A journey on business having compelled me to be for some time absent, I did not object to an official guardian supplying my place for the time, which was effected by the nomination of the town sequestrator, Herr Nussbach. Being now, however, finally settled here, and the welfare of the boy very precious to me, both love and duty demand that I should resume my rights, especially as this talented lad is coming to an age when greater care and expense must be bestowed on his education, on which his whole future prospects depend. 
This duty ought not to be confided to any woman, far less to his mother, who possesses neither the will nor the power to adopt those measures indispensable to a manly and suitable education. I am the more anxious to reclaim my guardianship of Carl, as I understand that, in consequence of want of means to defray the expenses of the school where I placed him, he is to be removed, and his mother wishes him to live with her, in order herself to spend his trifling provision, and thus save the one half of her pension which, according to the decree, she is bound to apply to his use. I have hitherto taken a paternal charge of my nephew, and I intend to do the same in future at my own expense, being resolved that the hopes of his deceased father and the expectations I have formed for this clever boy shall be fulfilled by his becoming an able man and a good citizen. With this view, I accordingly request that the highly respected magistrates whom I now address will be pleased to annul the town sequestrator Nussbach's interim office and forthwith transfer to me the sole guardianship of my nephew, Karl von Beethoven. Footnote 2. Ludwig von Beethoven. Footnote 1. Evidently drawn up by his advocate, Dr. Bach, from Beethoven's notes. Footnote 2. The magisterial degree of November 4th, 1819 was adverse to Beethoven. End letter number 281. End of section 13 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Stephen H. Wilson, Elkridge, Maryland. Prometheus.libsyn.com Prometheus Radio Theater www.prometheusradiotheater.com Section 14 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen H. Wilson. Selected Letters, number 287, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 287. To the Royal and Imperial High Court of Appeal, January 7th, 1820. Gentlemen, on the plea of the Decree A, I sought to have transferred to myself the guardianship of my nephew, Carl V. Beethoven, but was referred by the magistracy to the previous decision. On my consequent remonstrance, the same result ensued. I find myself the more aggrieved by this, inasmuch as not only are my own rights set at naught, but even the welfare of my nephew is thus utterly disregarded. I am therefore compelled to have recourse to the highest court of appeal to lay before them my well-founded claim, and rightfully to demand that the guardianship of my nephew should be restored to me. My reasons are the following. First, I am entitled to the guardianship of my nephew, not only by his father's will, but by the law, and this the court of justice confirmed to the exclusion of the mother. When business called me away from Vienna, I conceded that Herr Nussbach should act for me ad interim. Having now, however, taken up my residence here, the welfare of my nephew demands that I should again undertake the office of his guardian. Second, my nephew has arrived at an age when he requires to be trained to a higher degree of cultivation. Neither his mother nor his present guardian are calculated to guide the boy in the pursuit of his studies. The former, in the first place, because she is a woman, and as to her conduct, it has been legally proved that, to say the least of it, she has no creditable testimonials to bring forward. Footnote 1. On which account she was expressly prohibited from acting by the Court of Justice. How the Honorable Magistracy could nevertheless appoint her is quite incomprehensible. The latter is unfit, because on the one hand his office as sequestrator and administrator of houses and lands occupies his time too much to enable him properly to undertake the duties of guardian to the boy, and on the other, because his previous occupation as a paper manufacturer does not inspire me with any confidence that he possesses the intelligence or judgment indispensable to conduct a scientific education. Third, the welfare of my nephew is dearer to my heart than it can be to anyone else. I am myself childless, and have no relations except this boy, who is full of talent, and I have good grounds to hope the best for him if properly trained. Now I am compelled to hear that he has been delayed a whole year by remaining in his previous class from want of means to defray the expense, and that his mother intends to remove him from his present school and wishes him to live with her. 
What a misfortune to the boy were he to become a victim to the mismanagement of his mother, who would fain squander on herself that portion of her pension which she is obliged to devote to the education of her son. I have therefore declared in due form to the Honorable Magistracy that I am myself willing to undertake the expenses of his present school and also to provide the various masters required. Being rather deaf, which is an impediment to conversation, I have requested the aid of a colleague and suggested for this purpose Herr Peters, Councillor of Prince Lobkowitz, in order that a person may forthwith be appointed to superintend the education and progress of my nephew, that his moral character may one day command esteem, and whose acquirements may be a sure guarantee to all those who feel an interest in the youth's welfare, that he will undoubtedly receive the education and culture necessary to develop his abilities. My efforts and wishes have no other aim than to give the boy the best possible education, his abilities justifying the brightest hopes, and to fulfill the trust placed in my brotherly love by his father. The shoot is still flexible, but if longer neglected it will become crooked and outgrow the gardener's training hand and upright bearing, intellect and character, be destroyed forever. I know no duty more sacred than the education and training of a child. The chief duties of a guardian consist in knowing how to appreciate what is good and in adopting a right course. Then alone has proper attention been devoted to the welfare of his ward, whereas in opposing what is good he neglects his duty. Indeed, keeping in view what is most for the benefit of the boy, I do not object to the mother in so far sharing in the duties of a guardian that she may visit her son and see him and be apprised of all the measures adopted for his education, but to entrust her with the sole guardianship of the boy without a strict guardian by her side would cause the irrevocable ruin of her son. On these cogent grounds I reiterate my well-founded solicitation and feel the more confident of a favorable answer, as the welfare of my nephew alone guides my steps in this affair. Footnote 2 Ludwig von Beethoven Footnote 1 Schindler states that during these law proceedings the widow of Beethoven's brother had another child. Footnote 2. The court excluded Karl's mother from all share in his education and from all direct influence over her son and again restored to Beethoven the full authority of a guardian. End. Letter number 287. End of section 14 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Stephen H. Wilson, Elkridge, Maryland. Prometheus.libsyn.com Prometheus Radio Theater www.prometheusradiotheater Section 15 of Selected Letters of Beethoven This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Victor Guerreiro Selected Letters number 306 by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 306 to Ehren Peters and Company, Music Publishers, Leipzig, Vienna, June 5th, 1822. Gentlemen, you did me the honor to address a letter to me at a time when I was much occupied, and I have also been extremely unwell for the last five months. I now only reply to the principal points. Although I met Steiner by chance a few days ago, and asked him jestingly what he had brought me from Leipzig, he did not make the smallest allusion to your commission or to yourself. He urged me, however in the very strongest manner, to pledge myself to give him the exclusive right of publishing all my works, both present and future, and indeed to sign a contract to that effect which I declined. This trait sufficiently proves to you why I often give the preference to other publishers, both home and foreign. I love uprightness and integrity, and am of opinion that no one should drive a hard bargain with artists. For, alas, however brilliant the exterior of fame may appear, an artist does not enjoy the privilege of being the daily guest of Jupiter on Olympus, 
unhappily commonplace humanity only too often unpleasantly drags him down from this pure ethereal height. The greatest work I have hitherto written is a grand mass with choruses and four obligati voice parts and full orchestra. Several persons have applied to me for this work, and I have been offered 100 louis d'or art cash for it, but I demand at least 1,000 florins CM, for which sum I will also furnish a pianoforte arrangement. Variations on a waltz for the piano, they are numerous, 30 ducats in gold, and B, Vienna ducats. With regard to songs, I have several rather important descriptive ones, as, for example, a comic aria with full orchestra on Goethe's text, Mit Meden sich vertragen, and another aria in the same style, 16 ducats each, furnishing also a pianoforte arrangement if required. Also several descriptive songs with pianoforte accompaniment, 12 ducats each. Among these is a little Italian cantata with recitative. There is also a song with recitative among the German ones. A song with pianoforte accompaniment, 8 ducats. An elegy of four voices, with the accompaniment of two violins, viola and violoncello, 24 ducats. A dervice chorus with full orchestra, 20 ducats. Also the following instrumental music, a grand march for full orchestra with pianoforte accompaniment, 12 ducats, written for the tragedy of Tarpeia. Romance for the violin, a solo with full orchestra, 15 ducats. Grand set for two oboes and one English horn, which might be arranged for other instruments, 30 ducats. Four military marches with Turkish music, when applied for, I will name the sum. Bagatelle, or minor pianoforte solos, the price to be fixed when required. The above works are all completed. Solo pianoforte sonata, 40 ducats, which could soon be delivered. Quartet for two violins, tenor and violoncello, 50 ducats. This will also soon be ready. I am by no means so anxious about these, however, as about a full and complete edition of my works, being desirous to edit them during my lifetime. I have indeed received many proposals on this subject, but accompanied by stipulations to which I could scarcely agree, and which I neither could nor would fulfill. I am willing to undertake in the course of two years, or possibly a year, or a year and a half, with proper assistance, to edit and superintend a complete edition of my works, and to furnish a new composition in each style, namely a new work in the style of variations, one in the sonata style, and so on in every separate class of work that I have ever composed, and for the whole combined I ask 10,000 florins cm. I am no man of business, and only wish I were. As it is, I am guided by the offers made to me by different competitors for my works, and such a competition is rather strong just now. I request you to say nothing on the subject, because, as you may perceive from the proceedings of these gentlemen, I am exposed to a great deal of annoyance. When once my works appear published by you, I shall no longer be plagued. I shall be very glad if a connection be established between us, having heard you so well spoken of. You will then also find that I infinitely prefer dealing with one person of your description than with a variety of people of the ordinary stamp. Pray. Let me have an immediate answer, as I am now on the verge of deciding on the publication of various works. If you consider it worthwhile, be so good as to send me a duplicate of the list with which you furnished Herr Steiner. In the expectation of a speedy reply, I remain with esteem, your obedient, Ludwig van Beethoven. End of letter number 306 End of section 15 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Null and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Victor Guerreiro. Section 16 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Scott D. Farquhar. Selected Letters, Number 426, by Ludwig von Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter Number 426 to his nephew. I rejoice, my dear son, that you take pleasure in this new sphere, and such being the case, you must zealously strive to acquire what is necessary for it. I did not recognize your writing. I indeed look only to the sense and the meaning, but you must now attain some outward elegance also. If it is too hard a task for you to come here, give it up but if you can by any possibility do so, I shall rejoice in my desert home to have a feeling heart near me. If you do come, the housekeeper will settle that you leave Vienna at five o'clock, which leaves you ample time for your studies. I embrace you cordially. Your attached father. P.S. Don't forget to bring the Morgenblatt and Reese's letter. Footnote 1. Footnote 1. A letter from Rees of this date, in the Fischhoffsche Handschrift, is of sufficient interest to be given here at full length. Godesburg, June ninth, 1825. Dearest Beethoven, I returned a few days ago from Aix-la-Chapelle, and feel the greatest pleasure in telling you that your new symphony, the ninth, was executed with the most extraordinary precision and received with the greatest applause. It was a hard nut to crack, and the last day I rehearsed the finale alone for three hours. But I, in particular, and all the others, were fully rewarded by the performance. It is a work beside which no other can stand, and had you written nothing but this, you would have gained immortality. Whither will you lead us? As it will interest you to hear something of the performance, I will now briefly describe it. The orchestra and the choruses consisted of 422 persons, and many very distinguished people among them. The first day commenced with a new symphony of mine, and afterwards Handel's Alexander's Feast. The second day began with your new symphony, followed by the Davide Penitente of Mozart, the overture to the Flauto Magico, and the Mount of Olives. The applause of the public was almost terrific. I had been in Aix-la-Chapelle from the 3rd of May on purpose to conduct the rehearsals, and as a mark of the satisfaction and enthusiasm of the public, I was called forward at the close of the performance, when an ode and a laurel crown were presented to me by a lady, a very pretty one, too, and at the same moment another poem and a shower of flowers followed from the upper boxes. All was pleasure and contentment, and every one says that this is the finest of the seven Vitsuntide festivals held here. I cannot sufficiently lament that your other music arrived too late to make use of it. It was indeed utterly impossible to do so. I herewith send you, my dear friend, a check for forty Louis d'Or on Heppenmeyer and Company in Vienna according to our arrangement, and beg you will acknowledge the receipt, that I may settle everything relating to Aix-la-Chapelle. I am glad that you have not accepted any engagement in England. If you choose to reside there, you must previously take measures to ensure your finding your account in it. From the theatre alone Rossini got two thousand five hundred pounds. If the English wish to do anything at all remarkable for you, they must combine so that it may be well worth your while to go there. You are sure to receive enough of applause and marks of homage, but you have had plenty of these during your whole life. May all happiness attend you. Dear Beethoven, yours ever, Ferdinand Rees. End of letter number 426. End of section 16 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel and translated by Lady Grace Wallace.
Recording by Scott D. Farquhar, Baltimore, Maryland. www.splungemusic.com Section 17 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters Numbers 317, 318, 321, 325, 328 through 335, and 337 through 340 by Ludwig van Beethoven. As compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 317 to Schindler. My very best optimus optime. Pray try to hunt out a philanthropist who will advance me some money on a bank share, that I may not put the generosity of my friends too much to the test, nor myself be placed in difficulty by the delay of this money, for which I have to thank the fine plans and arrangements of my precious brother. You must not let it appear that this money is really wanted. End of letter number 317. Letter number 318. To Schindler. Dear Schindler, don't forget the bank share. It is greatly needed. It would be very annoying to be brought into court. Indeed, I would not be so for the whole world. My brother's conduct is quite worthy of him. The tailor is appointed to come to-day. Still, I hope to be able to get rid of him for the present by a few polite phrases. End of letter number 318. Letter number 321. To Schindler. Footnote 1. Dear Schindler, I am not sure whether the other copy was corrected or not, so I send you this one instead. As to N in S blank, I beg you not to say a word. B. L. is already very uneasy on the subject. In haste, your friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. We cannot understand what induced Beethoven, who lived in the same house with Schindler, to write to him, but he often did so to persons with whom he could easily have spoken, partly in order to get rid of the matter while it was in his thoughts, and also because he was a great deal from home, that is, going backwards and forwards from one lodging to another, having often several at the same time. End of letter number 321. Letter number 325 to Schindler. Imprimis. Papageno, not a word of what I said about Prussia. No reliance is to be placed on it. Martin Luther's table talk alone can be compared to it. I earnestly beg my brother also not to remove the padlock from his lips, and not to allow anything to transpire beyond the Zelfurstgasse. Footnote 1. Finis. Inquire of that arch-churl Diabelli when the French copy of the Sonata in C minor, opus 111, is to be published. I stipulated to have five copies for myself, one of which is to be on fine paper, for the cardinal, note the Archduke Rudolph. If he attempts any of his usual impertinence on this subject, I will sing him, in person, a bass aria in his warehouse, which shall cause it and all the street, note Graben, to ring. Footnote 2. Footnote 1. Schindler relates, quote, The royal decision, note, to subscribe for a copy of the Mass, was brought to Beethoven by the Chancellor of the Embassy, Hofrat Wernhardt. Whether Prince Hatzfeld, note, the ambassador, made the following offer from his own impulse, or in consequence of a commission from Berlin, is not known. At all events, the Hofrat put this question in the name of the Prince to the great composer, quote, Whether he would be disposed to prefer a royal order to the fifty ducats, End quote. Note, the sum demanded for the Mass. Beethoven replied at once, quote, the fifty ducats, end quote. Scarcely had the Chancellor left the room when Beethoven, in considerable excitement, indulged in all kinds of sarcastic remarks on the manner in which many of his contemporaries hunted after orders and decorations, these being, in his estimation, generally gained at the cost of the sanctity of art, end quote. Footnote 2. Schindler relates that Diabelli had refused to let Beethoven again have the manuscript of the Sonata, which he had repeatedly sent for when in the hands of the engraver, in order to correct and improve it. Diabelli, therefore, coolly submitted to all of this abuse of the enraged composer, and wrote to him that he would note down the threatened bass aria and publish it, but would give him the usual gratuity for it, and that Beethoven had better come to see him. On this, Beethoven said no more. This sonata is dedicated to the Archduke Rudolph, and is also published by Schlesinger. End of letter number 325. Letter number 328. Footnote 1. To Schindler. Hetzendorf, 1823. Samothracian vagabond. Footnote 2. 
You must hunt out from Schlemmer, note the copyist, what is still wanting in the Kyrie. Show him the postscript, and so, satis, no more of such a wretch. Farewell, arrange everything. I am to bind up my eyes at night, and to spare them as much as possible. Otherwise, says Smetna, I shall write little more music in the time to come. Footnote 1. Quote, we arrived at Hetzendorf on May 17th, end quote, is written by Karl in Beethoven's notebook of 1823, and on this note is written in the scamp's hand, Hetzendorf, 1823. Footnote 2. Quote, by the word Samothracian, Beethoven alludes to the Samothracian mysteries, partly grounded on music. Their mutual participation in the Beethoven mysteries is intended to be thus indicated. Among the initiated were also Brunswick, Lishnowski, and Smeskel. End quote. Note, from a note of Schindler's on the subject. End of letter number 328. Letter number 329 to Schindler. Hetzendorf, 1823, question mark. Pray forward the packet to-day, and inquire this afternoon, if possible, about the housekeeper in the Glockengasse, number 318, third étage. She is a widow, understands cookery, and is willing to serve merely for board and lodging, to which, of course, I cannot consent, or only under certain conditions. My present one is too shameful. I cannot invite you here, but be assured of my gratitude. End of letter number 329. Letter number 330. To Schindler, footnote 1. Hetzendorf, 1823. I enclose the letter to Herr von Abraskov, note, chargé d'affaires of the Russian legation. As soon as I receive the money, I will immediately send you fifty florins for your trouble, not a word more than is absolutely necessary. I have advertised your house. You can mention, merely as a casual remark at the right moment, that France also remitted the money to you. Never forget that such persons represent majesty itself. Footnote 1. Louis the Eighth sent a gold medal for his subscription copy of the Mass on February 20th, 1824. End of letter number 330. Letter number 331 to Schindler. I beg you will kindly write out the enclosed invitation neatly for me on the paper I send you, for Karl has too much to do. I wish to dispatch it early on Wednesday. I want to know where Grillpartzer lives. Perhaps I may pay him a visit myself. Footnote 1. You must have a little patience about the fifty florins. As yet it is impossible for me to send them, for which you are as much to blame as I am. Footnote 1. It is well known that in the winter of 1822-23 to 23, Beethoven was engaged in the composition of an opera for the Royal Theatre, for which purpose Grillpartzer had given him his Melusina. End of letter number 331. Letter number 332. To Schindler. I send K's, note, Kannes, book, Note, libretto. Except the first act, which is rather insipid, it is written in such a masterly style that it does not by any means require a first-rate composer. I will not say that on this very account it would be the more suitable for me. Still, if I can get rid of previous engagements, who knows what may or will happen. Please acknowledge the receipt of this. End of letter number 332. Letter number 333. To Schindler. I wish to know about Esterhazy, and also about the post. A letter-carrier from the Mauer, note, a place near Hetzendorf, was here. I only hope the message has been properly delivered. Nothing as yet from Dresden, note, see number 330. I mean to ask you to dine with me a few days hence, for I still suffer from my weak eyes. Today, however, for the first time they seem to improve, but I scarcely dare make any use of them as yet. Your friend, Beethoven. P.S. As for the Tokai, footnote one, it is better adapted for summer than for autumn, and also for some fiddler who could respond to its noble fire, and yet stand firm as a rock. Footnote one. A musical friend had sent the maestro six bottles of genuine Tokai, expressing his wish that it might tend to restore his strength. Schindler, he says, wrote to Beethoven at Hetzendorf to tell him of this, and received the above answer, and the order through Frau Schnapps to do as he pleased with the wine. He sent one bottle of it to Hetzendorf, but Beethoven at that time had inflamed eyes. End of letter number 333. Letter number 334. To Schindler. I cannot at present accept these tempting invitations, note from Zontag and Unger. So far as my weak eyes permit, I am very busy, and when it is fine I go out. I will myself thank these two fair ladies for their amiability. No tidings from Dresden. I shall wait till the end of this month and then apply to a lawyer in Dresden. 
I will write about Schoberlechner tomorrow. End of letter number 334. Letter number 335 to Schindler. June 18, 1823. You ought to have perfectly well known that I would have nothing to do with the affair in question. With regard to my being liberal, I think I have shown you that I am so on principle. Indeed, I suspect you must have observed that I even have gone beyond these principles. Sapienti sat. Footnote 1. Footnote 1. Franz Schoberlechner, pianist in Vienna, wrote to Beethoven on June 25, 1823, to ask him for letters of introduction to Leipzig, Dresden, Berlin, and Russia, etc. The maestro, however, wrote across the letter, quote, An active fellow requires no other recommendation than from one respectable family to another, end quote, and gave it back to Schindler, who showed it to Schoberlechner, and no doubt at his desire urged Beethoven to comply with his request. Beethoven, however, did not know Schoberlechner, and had no very high opinion of him, as he played chiefly bravura pieces, and, besides, on the bills of his concerts he pompously paraded all his titles, decorations, and as members of various societies, which gave ample subject for many a sarcastic remark on the part of Beethoven. End of letter number 335 Letter number 337 to Schindler Hetzendorf, July 1st, 1823 I am myself writing to Wocher, note, cabinet courier to Prince Esterhazy, question mark, number 333, and for more speed I send by Karl, who chances to be driving in, the application to Prince E. Be so good as to inquire the result. I doubt its being favourable, not expecting much kindly feeling on his part towards me, judging from former days. Footnote 1. I believe that female influence alone ensures success with him in such matters. At all events, I now know, by your obliging inquiries, how I can safely write to this Schultz. The bad weather, and more especially the bad atmosphere, prevented my paying her, note, Countess Schafgott, a visit about this affair. Footnote 2. Your amicus, Beethoven. P.S. Nothing yet from Dresden. Schlemmer, note, the copyist, has just been here again asking for money. I have now advanced him seventy gulden. Speculations are for commercial men, and not for poor devils like myself. Hitherto the sole fruit of this unlucky speculation, note a subscription for his mass, are only more debts. You have, no doubt, seen that the Gloria is completed. If my eyes were only strong again, so that I could resume my writing, I should do well enough. Note, written on the cover. Are the variations, note, opus 120, sent off yet to London? Nota bene. So far as I can remember, it was not mentioned in the application to Prince Esterhazy that the mass was to be delivered in manuscript only. What mischief may ensue from this? I suspect that such was the intention of Herr Artaria in proposing to present the mass gratis to the prince, as it would give Artaria an opportunity for the third time to steal one of my works. Wolcher's attention must be called to this. Of course, there is nothing obligatory on Papageno in the matter. Footnote 1 Beethoven wrote the Mass in C for him in the year 1807, which was by no means satisfactory to the prince when performed at Eisenstadt in the year following, and conducted by Beethoven himself. Footnote 2. Scholz, music director at Warmbrunn in Silesia, had written a German text for the Mass in C. Beethoven also wished to have from him a German translation from the Latin words adapted to the music of the Grand Mass. Schindler says that the words, quote, prevented my visiting her, end quote, refer to Countess Schafgotsch, whom Beethoven wished to see on account of Schultz, who unhappily died in the ensuing year. His text, however, is given in the Cecilia, 23 through 54. End of letter number 337. Letter number 338. To Pilat, editor of the Austrian Observer. Sir, I shall feel highly honoured if you will be so good as to mention in your esteemed journal my nomination as an honorary member of the Royal Swedish Musical Academy. Although neither vain nor ambitious, still I consider it advisable not wholly to pass over such an occurrence, as in practical life we must live and work for others, who may often eventually benefit by it. Forgive my intrusion, and let me know if I can in any way serve you in return, which it would give me much pleasure to do." I am, sir, with high consideration, your obedient Beethoven. End of letter number 338 Letter number 339 to Schindler Hetzendorf, July, 1823 Most worthy ragamuffin of Epirus and Brundusium! Give this letter to the editor of the Observer, but write the address on it first. 
ask him at the same time whether his daughter makes great progress on the piano, and if I can be of any use to her by sending her a copy of one of my compositions. I wrote that I was an honorary member. I don't know, however, whether this is correct. Perhaps I ought to have said a corresponding member, neither knowing nor caring much about such things. You had also better say something on the subject to Bernardum non sanctum, note, editor of the Vienna Zeitschrift. Make inquiries, too, from Bernard about that knave Ruprecht. Tell him of this queer business, and find out from him how he can punish the villain. Ask both these philosophical newspaper scribes whether this may be considered an honorable or dishonorable nomination. End of letter number 339. Letter number 340 to Schindler. Master flash in the pan and wide of the mark, full of reasons yet devoid of reason. Everything was ready yesterday for Glazer. Note the copyist. As for you, I shall expect you in Hetzendorf to dinner at half past two o'clock. If you come later, dinner shall be kept for you. End of letter number three hundred forty. End of section seventeen of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Section 18 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, numbers 341 through 344, 349, 358 through 360, 363, 368, 370 through 374, 400, 467, and 474, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 341, to Schindler. Hetzendorf, July 2nd, 1823. Worthy Herr V. Schindler, the incessant insolence of my landlord from the hour I entered his house up to the present moment compels me to apply for aid to the police, so I beg you will do so for me at once. As to the double winter windows, the housekeeper was desired to see about them, and especially to state if they were not necessary after such a violent storm, in case of the rain having penetrated into the room. But her report was that the rain had not come in, and, moreover, that it could not possibly do so. In accordance with her statements, I locked the door to prevent this rude man entering my room during my absence, which he had threatened. Say also, further, what his conduct to you was, and that he put up a placard of the lodgings being to let, without giving me notice, which, besides, he has no right to do till St. James's Day. He is equally unfair in refusing to give up the receipt from St. George's Day till St. James's, as the enclosure shows. I am charged, too, for lighting, of which I know nothing." This detestable lodging, footnote one, without any open stove, and the principal flue truly abominable, has cost me, for extra outlay exclusive of the rent, two hundred fifty-nine florins, in order merely to keep me alive while I was there during the winter. It was a deliberate fraud, as I never was allowed to see the rooms on the first floor, but only those on the second, that I might not become aware of their many disagreeable drawbacks. I cannot understand how a flu so destructive to health can be tolerated by the government. You remember the appearance of the walls of your room owing to smoke, and the large sum it cost even to lessen in any degree this discomfort, although to do away with it wholly was impossible. My chief anxiety at present is that he may be ordered to take down his placard, and to give me a receipt for the house-rent I have paid." but nothing will induce me to pay for the abominable lighting, without which it cost me enough actually to preserve my life in such a lodging. My eyes do not yet suffer me to encounter the town atmosphere, or I would myself apply in person to the police. You're attached, Beethoven. Footnote 1. The Fargasse in the Leimgrube, where Schindler lived with him. End of letter number 341. Letter number 342 to Schindler. I must have an attested copy of all the writings. I send you forty-five kreutzers. How could you possibly accept such a proposal from our churlish landlord when accompanied by a threat? Where was your good sense? Where it always is. 
"'Tomorrow early I shall send for the variations, copy and originals. "'It is not certain whether the PR comes or not, "'so be so good as to stay at home till eight o'clock. "'You can come to dinner either to-day or to-morrow, "'but you must settle which you mean to do, "'as it is not easy for me to provide provisions. "'Not later than half-past two o'clock. "'The housekeeper will tell you about a lodging in the Landstrasse. "'It is high time, truly. "'As soon as you hear of anything to be had on the Bastai or the Landstrasse, "'you must at once give me notice.' We must find out what room the landlord uses, on account of the well. Vale. End of letter number 342. Letter number 343. To Schindler. Footnote 1. Hetzendorf, 1823. Samothracian vagabond! You were dispatched yesterday to the South Pole, whereas we went off to the North Pole, a slight difference now equalized by Captain Perry. There were, however, no mashed potatoes there. Bach, note, his lawyer, to whom I beg my best regards, is requested to say what the lodging in Baden is to cost. We must also try to arrange that Karl should come to me once every fortnight there, but cheaply, good heavens, poverty and economy. I entrust this matter to you, as you have your friends and admirers among the drivers and liverymen. If you get this in time, you had better go to Bach to-day, so that I may receive his answer to-morrow forenoon. It is almost too late now. You might also take that rascal of a copyist by surprise. I don't expect much good from him. He has now had the variations for eight days. Your, note, friend, stroked out, Amicus Beethoven. Footnote 1. He no doubt alludes to Captain Perry, the celebrated traveller, who wrote an article in the A.M. Zeitung on the music of the Eskimo. End of letter number 343. Letter number 344. To Schindler. Footnote 1. June 1823. Samothracian, don't trouble yourself to come here till you receive a hati sharif. I must say you do not deserve the golden cord. My fast-sailing frigate, the worthy and well-born Frau Schnapps, will call every three or four days to inquire after your health. Farewell. Bring no one whatever with you. Farewell. Footnote 1. Schindler says in his biography, quote, These variations, note, Opus 120, were completed in June 1823, and delivered to the publisher Diabelli, without the usual amount of time bestowed on giving them the finishing touches, and now he set to work at once on the Ninth Symphony, some jottings of which were already written down. Forthwith, all the gay humour that had made him more sociable, and in every respect more accessible, at once disappeared. All visits were declined, end quote, etc. End of letter number 344. Letter number 349 to Schindler. August 1823. You Samothracian villain! Make haste and come, for the weather is just right. Better early than late. Presto, prestissimo. We are to drive from here. Footnote 1. Footnote 1. Beethoven had apartments in a summer residence of Baron Prones on his beautiful property at Hetzendorf. Suddenly, however, the maestro, deeply immersed in the Ninth Symphony, was no longer satisfied with this abode, because, quote, the Baron would persist in making him profound bows every time that he met him. End quote. So, with the help of Schindler and Frau Schnapps, he removed to Baden in August, 1823. End of letter number 349. Letter number 358. To Schindler. Baden, September, 1823. Signore Papageno, that your scandalous reports may no longer distress the poor Dresdener, I must tell you that the money reached me today, accompanied by every possible mark of respect to myself though I should have been happy to offer you a substantial acknowledgment for the, note, illegible, effaced by Schindler, you have shown me, I cannot yet accomplish to the full extent what I have so much at heart. I hope to be more fortunate some weeks hence. Note, see number 329. Per il Signore Nobile, Papageno Schindler. End of letter number 358. Letter number 359 to Schindler. 1823. The occurrence that took place yesterday, which you will see in the police reports, is only too likely to attract the notice of the established police to this affair. 
the testimony of a person whose name is not given entirely coincides with yours. In such a case, private individuals cannot act. The authorities alone are empowered to do so. Footnote 1. Yours, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Schindler says, quote, Brother Johann the apothecary was ill in the summer of 1823, and during that time his disreputable wife visited her lover, an officer, in the barracks, and was often seen walking with him in the most frequented places, besides receiving him in her own house. Her husband, though confined to bed, could see her adorning herself to go in search of amusement with her admirer. Beethoven, who was informed of this scandal from various quarters, appealed vigorously to his brother, in the hope of persuading him to separate from his ill-conducted wife, but failed in his attempt, owing to the indolence of this ill-regulated man. End quote. It was Schindler, too, who prevented Beethoven making any further application to the police. The following note probably refers to this. In his notebook of November 1823 is a canon written by Beethoven on his brother Johann and his family, on these words, quote, Fett Lümmel Bankert haben triumphiert, end quote. No doubt an allusion to the disgraceful incident we have mentioned. Brother Johann's wife had a very lovely daughter before she married him. End of letter number 359. Letter number 360 to Schindler. Wiseacre, I kiss the hem of your garment. End of letter number 360. Letter number 363 to Schindler. 1824. Frau S. Note, schnapps, will provide what is required, so come to dinner today at two o'clock. I have good news to tell you, footnote one, but this is quite entre nous, for the brain eater, note, his brother Johann, must know nothing about it. Footnote one. This no doubt refers to a letter from Prince Galizin, March 11th, 1824. Quote, I beg you will be so good as to let me know when I may expect the quartet, which I await with the utmost impatience. If you require money, I request you will draw on Monsieur Stieglitz and Company in St. Petersburg for the sum you wish to have, and it will be paid to your order. End, quote. End of letter number 363. Letter number 368 to Herr Schindler. Do not come to me till I summon you. No concert. Beethoven. End of letter number 368. Letter number 370 to Schindler, 1824. If you have any information to give me, pray write it down, but seal the note for which purpose you will find wax and a seal on my table. Let me know where Dupont, footnote one, lives, when he is usually to be met with, and whether I could see him alone, or if it is probable that people will be there, and who. I feel far from well. Portez-vous bien. I am still hesitating whether to speak to Dupont or write to him, which I cannot do without bitterness. Do not wait dinner for me. I hope you will enjoy it. I do not intend to come, being ill from our bad fare of yesterday. A flask of wine is ready for you. Footnote 1. Schindler says that on April 24th, 1824, he applied to Dupont, at that time administrator of the Kärntnotor Theater, in Beethoven's name, to sanction his giving a grand concert there, allowing him to have the use of the house for the sum of 400 florins cm. Further, that the conducting of the concert should be entrusted to Umlauf and Schupanzig, and the solos to Mesdames Unger and Zontag, and to the bass singer Preisinger. End of letter number 370. Letter number 371, footnote 1, to Schindler. To Schindler, I beg you will come to see me tomorrow, as I have a tale to tell you as sour as vinegar— Dupart said yesterday that he had written to me, though I have not yet got his letter, but he expressed his satisfaction, which is best of all. The chief feat, however, is not yet performed, that which is to be acted in front of the proscenium. Note, in Beethoven's writing, Yours from C-sharp below to high F, Beethoven. Footnote 1, written by his nephew. End of letter number 371. Letter number 372. To Schindler. After six weeks of discussion here, there, and everywhere, I am fairly boiled, stewed, and roasted. What will be the result of this much-talked-of concert if the prices are not raised? What shall I get in return for all my outlay, as the copying alone costs so much? End of letter number 372. 
Letter number 373 to Schindler. At twelve o'clock today, quote, in die Birne, end quote, note, an inn on the Landstrasse, thirsty and hungry, then to the coffee-house, back again here, and straight to Penzing, or I shall lose the lodging. End of letter number 373. Letter number 374 to Schindler. When you write to me, write exactly as I do to you, without any formal address or signature. Vita brevis ars longa. No necessity for details, only the needful. End of letter number 374. Letter number 400 to Schindler. The spring of 1825. I have waited till half-past one o'clock, but, as the caput confusum has not come, I know nothing of what is likely to happen. Karl must be off to the university in the Prater, so I am obliged to go, that Karl, who must leave this early, may have his dinner first. I am to be found in the, quote, wilde Mann, end quote, an inn in the Prater. To Herr Schindler, Moravian numbskull, footnote one. Footnote one. Schindler was a Moravian. End of letter number 400. Letter number 467 to Schindler. The end of February, 1827. When we meet, we can discuss the mischance that has befallen you. I can send you some person without the smallest inconvenience. Do accept my offer. It is at least something. Have you had no letters from Moskalis or Kramer? There will be a fresh occasion for writing on Wednesday, and once more urging my project. If you are still indisposed at that time, one of my people can take the letter and get a receipt from the post office. Vale et fave. I need not assure you of my sympathy with your misfortune. Pray, allow me to supply board for you in the meantime. I offer this from my heart. May heaven preserve you. Your sincere friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 467. Letter number 474. Footnote 1. To Schindler. March 17th, 1827. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful! Both the learned gentlemen are defeated, and I shall be saved solely by Malfatti's skill. You must come to me for a few minutes without fail this forenoon. Yours, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Schindler dates this note March 17th, 1827, and says that these are the last lines Beethoven ever wrote. They certainly were the last that he wrote to Schindler. On the back of the note, in another writing, probably Schindler's, the receipt is given in pencil for the bath with hay steeped in it, ordered by Malfatti, which the poor invalid thought had saved his life. The, quote, learned gentlemen, end quote, are Dr. Vavruch and the surgeon Zybert, who had made the punctures. End of letter number 474. End of section 18 of Selected Letters of Beethoven as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Section 19 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Selected Letters, Numbers 39, 278 through 280, 295, 296, 298, and 309, by Ludwig von Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Knoll, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter Number 39, to Messrs. Artaria and Company, Footnote 1, Vienna, June 1st, 1805. I must inform you that the affair about the new quintet is settled between Count Fries and myself. The Count has just assured me that he intends to make you a present of it. It is too late today for a written agreement on the subject, but one shall be sent early in the ensuing week. This intelligence must suffice for the present, and I think I, at all events, deserve your thanks for it. Your obedient servant, Ludwig van Beethoven. Footnote 1. The quintet is probably not that in C, Opus 29, dedicated to Count von Fries, previously published in 1803 by Breitkopf and Hertel, see number 27. It is more likely that he alludes to a new quintet, which the Count had no doubt ordered. End of letter number 39. Letter number 278. To Herr Artaria, Vienna. October 1st, 1819. 
most excellent and most virtuous of virtuosi, and no humbug. While informing you of all sorts of things from which we hope you will draw the best conclusions, we request you to send us six, say six, copies of the sonata in B-flat major, and also six copies of the variations on the Scotch songs, as the authors write. We beg you to forward them to Steiner and Paternoster Gesell, whence they will be sent to us with some other things. In the hope that you are conducting yourself with all due propriety and decorum, we are your, etc., B. End of letter number 278. Letter number 279. A sketch written by Beethoven, corrected by Artaria's bookkeeper, Wuster. 1819. Having heard from Herr B. that your Royal Highness, the Archduke Rudolph, has written a most masterly work, we wish to be the first to have the great honor of publishing your Royal Highness's composition, that the world may become acquainted with the admirable talents of so illustrious a prince. We trust your Royal Highness will comply with our respectful solicitation. Falstaff, footnote one, ragged rascal. Footnote one, the name Beethoven gave to Artaria's partner, Bolderini. End of letter number 279. Letter number 280, to Artaria. Mödling, October 12, 1819. Pray forgive me, dear A, for plaguing you as follows. We are coming to town the day after tomorrow, and expect to arrive at four o'clock. The two days festival compels us to return the same day, as Karl must prepare with his master here for the second examination, these very holidays enabling the tutor to devote more time to him. But I must soon return to town on account of the certificate of Karl's birth, which costs more time and money than I like. I at all times dislike traveling by the diligence, and this one has moreover one peculiarity, that you may wish to go on what day you please, but it always turns out to be a Friday on which it sets off. And, though a good Christian, still one Friday in the year is sufficient for me. I beg you will request the leader of the choir, the devil alone knows what the office is, to be so good as to give us Carl's certificate of birth on the afternoon of the same day, if possible. He might do so at seven o'clock in the morning, at the time we arrive, but he ought to be punctual, for Carl is to appear at the examination at half-past seven o'clock. So it must be either tomorrow at seven, or at all events in the afternoon. We shall call on you tomorrow before seven o'clock to inquire about this, with the proviso of a visit later in the day. In haste, and asking your pardon, your L. von Beethoven. End of letter number 280. Letter number 295. To Herr Artaria, Falstaff, and Company. Vienna, October twenty sixth, 1820. I politely request that you will hand over to Herr Oliva the sum of three hundred florins, which has no doubt already been received by you in full. Having been entirely occupied by removing to my new lodgings, I could not do myself the honor of expressing my thanks to you and Sir John Falstaff in person. Your obedient servant, Ludwig V. Beethoven. End of letter number 295. Letter number 296. To Boldarini. My very worthy Falstaff, I request with all due civility that you will send me a copy of each of the two works for pianoforte and flute, with variations. As for the receipt, you shall have it tomorrow, and I also beg you will forward it forthwith. Give my compliments to Herr Artaria, and thank him from me for his kind offer of an advance, but as I have received from abroad the money due to me, I do not require to avail myself of his aid. Farewell, Knight Falstaff. Do not be too dissipated. Read the gospel, and be converted. We remain your well-affected Beethoven. To Sir John Falstaff, Knight, to the care of Herr Artaria and Company. End of letter number 296. Letter number 298. To Herr Artaria and Company. Vienna, December 17th, 1820. I thank you warmly for the advance of 150 florins, for which I have made out the receipt in the name of His Imperial Highness the Cardinal, and I beg, as I am in danger of losing one of my bank shares, that you will advance me another 150 florins, which I pledge myself to repay within three months at latest from this date. As a proof of my gratitude, I engage in this letter to make over to you, as your exclusive property, one of my compositions, consisting of two or more movements, without claiming payment for it hereafter. Your ever complacent, Beethoven, L.S. End of letter number 298. Letter number 309. To Herr Artaria. August 22, 1822. 
Being overwhelmed with work, I can only briefly say that I will always do what I can to repay your obliging kindness to me. With regard to the Mass, I have been offered 1,000 florins CM for it. My circumstances do not permit me to accept a less sum from you. All that I can do is to give you the preference. Rest assured that I do not ask you one farthing more than others have offered me, which I can prove to you by written documents. You can consider about this, but I must request you to send me an answer on the subject tomorrow, it being a post-day, and my decision expected elsewhere. With regard to the 150 florins for which I am your debtor, I intend to make you a proposal, as I stand in great need of the 1,000 florins. I beg you will observe strict secrecy as to the Mass. Now, as ever, your grateful friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 309. End of section 19 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. Recording by Sean Dougal. www.electromonkeymedia.com Section 20 of Selected Letters of Beethoven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar. Selected Letters, Numbers 42, 167, 168, 228, 229, 230, and 255, by Ludwig van Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel, and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Letter number 42. Testimonial for C. Cherney. Vienna, December 7, 1805. I, the undersigned, am glad to bear testimony to young Carl Cherney having made the most extraordinary progress on the pianoforte, far beyond what might be expected at the age of fourteen. I consider him deserving of all possible assistance, not only from what I have already referred to, but from his astonishing memory, and more especially from his parents having spent all their means in cultivating the talent of their promising son. Ludwig van Beethoven End of letter number 42 Letter number 167 To Cherney Footnote 1 My dear Cherney, Pray give the enclosed to your parents for the dinners the boy had recently at your house. I positively will not accept these gratis. Moreover, I am very far from wishing that your lessons should remain without remuneration. Even those already given must be reckoned up and paid for. Only I beg you to have a little patience for a time, as nothing can be demanded from the widow, and I had and still have heavy expenses to defray. But I borrow from you for the moment only. The boy is to be with you today, and I shall come later. Your friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Carl Cherney, the celebrated pianist and composer for whom Beethoven wrote a testimonial in 1805. See number 42. He gave lessons to Beethoven's nephew in 1815 and naturally protested against any payment, which gave rise to the expressions on the subject in many of his notes to Cherney of which there appear to be a great number. End of letter number 167. Letter number 168. To Cherney. Footnote 1. Vienna, February 12, 1816. Dear Cherney, I cannot see you today, but I will call tomorrow, being desirous to talk to you. I spoke out so bluntly yesterday that I much regretted it afterwards. But you must forgive this on the part of an author who would have preferred hearing his work as he wrote it, however charmingly you played it. I will, however, amply atone for this by the violoncello sonata. Footnote 2. Rest assured that I cherish the greatest regard for you as an artist, and I shall always endeavor to prove this. Your true friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Cherny in the A. M. Zeitung. 1845 relates, on one occasion, in 1812, at Schapanzig's concert, when playing Beethoven's quintet with wind instruments, I took the liberty, in my youthful levity, to make many alterations, such as introducing difficulties into the passages, making use of the upper octaves, etc., etc. 
Beethoven sternly and deservedly reproached me for this in the presence of Schuponzig, Linke, and the other performers. Footnote 2. Opus 69, which Czerny, C. A. M. Zeitung, was to perform with Linke the following week. End of letter number 168. Letter number 228. To Czerny. Dear Czerny, I beg you will treat Carl with as much patience as possible, for though he does not as yet get on quite as you and I could wish, still I fear he will soon do even less, because, though I do not want him to know it, he is over-fatigued by the injudicious distribution of his lesson hours. Unluckily, it is not easy to alter this, so pray, however strict you may be, show him every indulgence, which will, I am sure, have also a better effect on Carl under such unfavorable circumstances. With respect to his playing with you, when he has finally acquired the proper mode of fingering and plays in right time and gives the notes with tolerable correctness, you must only then first direct his attention to the mode of execution, and when he is sufficiently advanced, do not stop his playing on account of little mistakes, but only point them out at the end of the piece. Although I have myself given very little instruction, I have always followed this system, which quickly forms a musician. And this is, after all, one of the first objects of art, and less fatiguing both to master and scholar. In certain passages, like the following, I wish all the fingers to be used, and also in similar ones, such as these. so that they may go very smoothly. Such passages can indeed be made to sound very perle or like a pearl played by fewer fingers, but sometimes we wish for a different kind of jewel. Footnote 1. More as to this some other time. I hope that you will receive these suggestions in the same kindly spirit in which they are offered and intended. In any event, I am, and ever must remain, your debtor. May my candor serve as a pledge of my wish to discharge this debt at some future day. Your true friend, Beethoven. Footnote 1. Karl Czerny relates in the Vienna A. M. Zeitung of 1845, number 113, as follows. Beethoven came to me usually every day himself with the boy, and used to say to me, You must not think that you please me by making Karl play my works. I am not so childish as to wish anything of the kind. Give him whatever you think best. I named Clementi. Yes, yes, said he, Clementi is very good indeed. And, added he, laughing, give Carl occasionally what is according to rule, that he may hereafter come to what is contrary to rule. After a hit of this sort, which he introduced into almost every speech, he used to burst into a loud peal of laughter, having in the earlier part of his career been often reproached by the critics with his irregularities. He was in the habit of alluding to this with gay humor. End of letter number two twenty eight. Letter number two twenty nine. To Cherney, dear Cherney, I beg you will say nothing on that particular subject at Gianatasio's, who dined with us on the day you were so good as to call on me. He requested this himself. I will tell you the reason when we meet. I hope to be able to prove my gratitude for your patience with my nephew, that I may not always remain your debtor. In haste, your friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 229. Letter number 230. To Cherney. Dear Cherney, can you in any way assist the man I now send to you, a pianoforte maker and tuner from Baden, in selling his instruments? Though small in size, their manufacture is solid. In haste, your friend, Beethoven. End of letter number 230. Letter number 255. To Cherney. My dear, good, kind Cherney. Footnote 1. I have this moment heard that you are in a position I really never suspected. You might certainly place confidence in me and point out how matters could be made better for you 
without any pretensions to patronage on my part. As soon as I have a moment to myself, I must speak to you. Rest assured that I highly value you, and am prepared to prove this at any moment by deeds. Yours with sincere esteem, L. von Beethoven. Footnote 1. Zellner, in his Blatter für Musik, relates what follows on Czerny's own authority. In 1818, Czerny was requested by Beethoven in a letter, which he presented some years ago to Cox, the London music publisher, to play at one of his last concerts in the large Redoutensaal, his E-flat major concerto, Opus 73. Czerny answered, in accordance with the truth, that having gained his livelihood entirely for many years past by giving lessons on the piano for more than twelve hours daily, he had so completely laid aside his pianoforte playing that he could not venture to attempt playing the concerto properly within the course of a few days, which Beethoven desired, on which he received, in the above letter, a touching proof of Beethoven's sympathy. He also learned subsequently that Beethoven had exerted himself to procure him a permanent situation. End of letter number 255. End of section 20 of Selected Letters of Beethoven, as compiled and with footnotes by Dr. Ludwig Noel and translated by Lady Grace Wallace. Recording by Scott D. Farquhar. Baltimore, Maryland, www.splungemusic.com.